my client is that client who's like, you know, they did IKEA when they graduated from college, mm -hmm. you know, and now they want something special. You know, they're they're ready to spend fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars on a chair. I want something cool, unique, funky, one off in my house. You know, I tell my clients, I was like, you buy a piece from me, it'll be the first time that furniture ever holds its value. Hey everybody, welcome to episode sixty three of the Andrew Deitch podcast. How's it going? Did you did you miss me? It's been over a week. It's been a minute. I haven't uploaded in over a week, but I'm feeling pumped right now um, because I recorded this episode on Monday and I recorded three full-length episodes yesterday. So in the past like 48 hours, I've done four podcasts, which is pretty, pretty intense. But um, the holidays are kind of slowing down the numbers a little bit, but I don't really care, you know? I'm still pumping out the goods. Um, so if this is your first time joining me, um, hi, hope you're, hope you're doing well on this, on this fine Wednesday. Um, it's a little rainy here, but, uh, I don't mind. doesn't kill my, doesn't kill my vibe. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to thank you for joining us here today. I know there's, there's a million other things you could be listening to right now and you chose to check this out. And, uh, I do my best here to have meaningful conversations with the most fascinating and interesting people that I know. Um, I love talking to people with different perspectives and paths and people that are, you know, just kind of different, like they don't do things the normal way. Um, so it's always it's always fun for me to do this show. I really love doing it, but um, I don't have much time to talk. So let's just jump into the show. My guest today is the Kevin Fuller. And Kevin is a dope and unique furniture designer. Um, he's also a world traveler, and he's just an all-around awesome and thoughtful dude. Um, deep down, he's just a freaking entrepreneur. Um, he started and successfully run a handful of companies, ranging from coffee to electrical and home theaters to building houses. And now he is the owner of The Kevin Fuller, where he specializes in creating some of the dopest and unique furniture around. And I was introduced to Kevin through our mutual friend, Matt B. Davis, the host of the Atlanta podcast, which recently got picked up by Creative Loafing. Huge shout out for that. Definitely one of my favorite podcasts right now. Go check it out. But anyways, Matt, anyways, anyways Matt shot me a message and said, hey, you definitely need to have this guy on the show. He seems right up your alley. And so here we are. And I met Kevin at his home. He was very gracious to invite me over to his house to do the podcast. And he was also very gracious to offer me an excellent Cuban cigar and some tasty Japanese whiskey to sip on during this podcast. And uh, this was not the first time with whiskey on the podcast, but it was the first time for cigars. And I got to say, it was a great experience. Uh, at first, I thought it might distract me a little bit, but it kind of kind of gave me something to fidget with. You know, I liked it. I might have to do cigars on the show more often. Um, I know my mom won't be too happy about that. She doesn't like cigars. There's my dad. But you know what? I don't care. Um, anyways, let's just get into the show. So without any further ado, please welcome my new friend, the Kevin Live. <laughs> cool. Kevin Fuller. Can I say it properly? Kevin Fuller. V. Yeah. V. Kevin, Kevin Fuller. Fuller. Which is I forgot the V. Important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. man. So yeah. we were Good. we were just talking, um, for people who are listening, we were just talking kind of about why I ask people to be on the podcast and who, what types of people. And um our friend Matt message me he's like yo this guy kevin he's right. really cool you should have him on the podcast yeah so i just hit you up and here we are yeah cool very cool yeah matt and i go back he we were in a men's group together and then we've always had like a kindred spirit of entrepreneurship you know mm -hmm. i admire matt because he takes you know massive risk no parachute i, I kind of want to like have a feeling the parachute's kind of there mm -hmm. but he just jumps and I, I love that about him yeah but definitely. um you know he, he He's definitely one of the people that motivated me, inspired me to 
get back out and do my own thing. Because when I met him, I had, like I said, I owned electronic environments, you know, where mm-hmm. we did electrical and systems integration work. And it was fun. You know, I created a company where I, um, I could work with my best friend every day. So me and my partner, Lee McKinney, had that company for a while. And, um, yeah, no problem. We, um, we did that. We had a good time, you know, but more money, more problems. <laughs> mm-hmm. Payroll gets crazy. Mm-hmm. Employees get crazy. Finding employees gets crazy. Mm-hmm. For sure. The IRS calls you. <laughs> Don't ever want that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> ever want that phone call. No, no, that's for sure. So, yeah, so we just decided to close up shop. And just I feel you. Do other things. That's cool, yeah. man. Yeah. So for just for people to have some context, we're chilling at Kevin's house, smoking some cigars, got some, <laughs> got some whiskey, got some coffee. Yep. I have, a, I have a feeling this is going to be a good podcast. If you have, I've, I've, I've never done a podcast with cigars before. Well, that's I was telling someone like I want to be on um, the cover of of um, home design magazine, the furniture design magazine. Mm-hmm. But I, I want to be the first person doing it, smoking a cigar. Uh, like I want to have like a stick. I want to be masculine. I don't want to be, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you're thinking, I mean, most people are thinking furniture design. They're thinking like a female interior designer kind of deal. Yeah, big time. And that's one of the things I have. A buddy of mine calls me a unicorn in the industry. He's like, like, dude, you're a six-foot black straight guy. Like, they're not (laughs) expecting you. (laughs) Like, no one knows what the hell you're there for. You either rob them or sell them something. You know, so that he's like, no one knows. So that's funny, man. So I, I, I get it. That's I, cool. I, I get it. That's cool. Know? And it was just, just happen chance. Like I, I loved it. You know, I, I just love creating. And I have a mentor, and she was like, you know, it doesn't take much to design. You know, once you design, you just got to figure out how to get it done, mm-hmm. and the right resources <clears throat> to get everything done. So it's been, it's been fun. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, so fun. a lot of my podcasts. When I, when I first had the idea of it, I was like, I want to share. I, I have this belief that there's no, there's always two sides to every coin. Mm-hmm. You know, some, a lot of people just want to look at something and say, black and white, there's only one way to look at it. Right. I think everyone who's mature enough realizes that obviously there's two sides to every coin, but we tend to not think about it. You know, like if I meet you, like you said, you're a, I meet, okay, this is Kevin. He's a six foot tall, black, <laughs> straight black dude who right. designs furniture. But like, what I'm not seeing is all the things that, that led up to the Kevin of today. Got you. You know? Got and you. so, like, if you can, just, like, kind of give us, like, a ha- what were the, like, major milestones, I guess, of, of your down. life that kind of led you up to where you're at now. Whew. Wow. And not to, like, get to, like, you know, okay, when I was a baby, but, you know, Got like. You. It, well, yeah, some of my milestones did come as a kid. That's good. You know? That's which, good. Which I will say. And I, and I kind of like that. You know, sometimes people don't want to talk about their childhood or whatever, but. I, I'm of the mindset that, of course, like so oh, much of that is how you get molded. Man, I had the best childhood on earth. Really? Like, <laughs> my parents are incredible. You know, I, I, I can't complain about my childhood at all. That's you know, awesome. I think one of the turning points for me is I moved to Germany when I was a kid. Wow. And I was there for junior high school and high school. And, you know, when it's six hours on a Friday to catch a train down to Italy at 16, 17 years old, like that's that's different you know when I, when you're i was a teenager experiencing different cultures you know i was so close to everything in europe you know our parents took us around and we got to see everything and it's like visiting alabama right and <laughs> yeah, exactly what well, exactly you know but instead it's in a whole nother language whole nother country whole nother you know culture um so that just opened my eyes to like you know being bigger than and who I am and what I am. That's really cool. Yeah. So, w- when you were you born in Georgia or? No, I was born in Baltimore. Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. And you said yeah. so when so you you moved when you were in junior high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm assuming it was a job situation or something like that. Like your parents had a job yeah. opportunity. Yeah, yeah. My dad had a job opportunity. My dad's a DOD civilian, um, which means he works for the military, but he's not in the military. Huh. So one of the advantages we had was that um, I didn't I couldn't live on base. So I lived on the German economy. So like my uh-huh. neighbors were German, you know, the neighborhood I was in was German. So like I was really just exposed to the culture. That's really of, cool. Of going, which was great. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So then, you know, I just learned. What part of Germany? I was in Nuremberg. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. 
and I noticed like, that you you're very you you have your background was a Porsche. Yep. You've got a Volkswagen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah. assuming you have you have an affinity for some nah. for some German cars potentially. Um, <laughs> some I'm a Volkswagen group. <laughs> I'm a Porsche fanatic. Like I love Porsche. Like my dream car was always a Porsche Cayenne, mm -hmm. and I actually had the chance to buy one, and I ha I had it for about a year and a half or so, and I, I loved the vehicle. It was it was incredible, and it was like at the time. Porsche was saying it's the fastest SUV, it, and you know I didn't have a turbo, but it was it's quick. It was a freaking fast SUV. Mm -hmm. You know, soccer mom should not be driving that car. No. It, it was it was quick. So like I had a chance to earn to like to own a Porsche, and that was like one of my dreams in life was to own a Porsche. So I thought, mm -hmm. you know, like like you don't know. But growing up in Germany, yeah, I went to the Mercedes Benz factory, the BMW factory, things like that. That's so, so cool. The Volkswagen is happenstance because, like, before I got the Volkswagen, I was driving, like, a Ford Escape mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I, that I had bought. Like, you know, my life really downsized in, like, 13. You know, like, when we closed electronic environments, it was like, what was I going to do next? You know, and, and that's why I named my company the Kevin Fuller. That's why I came up with Kevin Fuller because, like, everyone knew me as Kevin from electronic environments. You know, so I was like, the next thing I do, it's going to be it's going to be me. It's going to be mm -hmm. all me, unabashedly me, you know, rich or poor. It's going to be me. Like, I, that's, the, that's the last thing I'm giving up anymore is just being myself. You know, I don't want to change my narrative because, you know, I was given this opportunity and I lived this life so I could be me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to fit in. I damn sure don't want to fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, so I named the, I named the company. Um, the first name of the company was Design Studio 72. Because I was like, yeah, the Kevin Fuller, that's kind of too brash. That's kind of too brash. Mm -hmm. That's really going to cut some folks the wrong way. So I named it Design Studio 72. Um, and the first year uh, I made, you know, not shit for money. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, but it wasn't, it wasn't about that. It's still not about that. It's about the fun of it. And then, um, I don't know, like Design Studio 72, it was cool, but it, it didn't, it's not what I said I wanted to do with my life. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, I just named it, you know, the Kevin Fuller. Period. Period. Just the Kevin Fuller, you know. And I, um, I was talking to um, some friends, and they're like, you know, you could be a lifestyle brand of like furniture. And I was like, lifestyle brand. I just want to be the Kevin Fuller. Like, I, that's that's it. I, I do this because I love it. I, you know. So I remember when I when I, I did first start in this business, I had a client. I had my first client, and it took forever to do her damn chairs. And I was like, this is God awful. Like, and I gotta listen to this lady talk to me. Like, okay, for, for future people that will be clients later, like, hear the whole story, just don't take this clip out of my ass. <laughs> Woo -hoo. And I was like, this is sucks. I was like, clients suck. I don't want, I don't want clients at mm -hmm. all. I was like, this is difficult. You know, mm -hmm. they don't know what they want. Then when you show them something that, you know, I was like, this sucks, clients suck. So that's when, I, that's when I was like, you know what? I'm gonna like stick to like being an artist. Like my shit is art, you know? It's, it's one of a kind, you know, if I build it for you, it's, I don't duplicate anyone's stuff. Like my, my shit is art, mm -hmm. and that's how I look at it. It's functional art. You can sit on it, you know, you can work with it, but it's functional art. So I was like, you know, fuck it. It's the Kevin Fuller, like that's how I'm writing. You there know? we go. I don't want, you know, no one else to know I don't want to be the Kevin, Kevin Fuller from Design Studio 72. No, I just want to be the Kevin Fuller. That, there we go. That, I like it. that. That's like the Andrew Deitch podcast. It's just me. <laughs> exactly. Like, why? Yeah. You know, we're all brands these days. Mm -hmm. It's very true. <laughs> and it's yeah. the first time where, you know, with social media, you can actually put yourself out there, have an online business and not have to go through traditional outlets. And obviously that's something that has been beat to death as far as, with podcasts, people are talking about it all the time because that's right. what podcasts are. Right. It's a free form of distributing content to people, right. but it's interesting and right. and uh, and it's going to disrupt disrupt every single industry that we know of. I think it already is. It, it yeah, it totally yeah. is. You know, there's designers that have podcasts and blogs. You know, uh, I think a lot of vlogs and a lot of blogs because you know we're in a visual business, mm -hmm. but it's there you know everyone's doing it for sure you know and it's and it's not about there's plenty of room for everybody mm -hmm. 
you know. I, lo I love that, man. Like, I hate when people think that it's a zero-sum game mm -hmm. and like I have, in order for me to succeed, you have to fail. Mm -hmm. I'm totally not about that. Exactly, and in the design world, what I'm finding is that it's all about what do you look like, what shoes are you wearing, you know, what parties have you been to, Ugh. you know. But then the sad thing is interior designers don't buy my stuff. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's a couple that I work with and I enjoy work with, and I'm sure I'll work with more as time goes on and, and honestly as my stuff improves, but you know, you do this dog and pony show for folks that aren't gonna call you back, they're not gonna buy your stuff, they're not gonna support you. Mm. And I was like, why? And I'm like, at these events, I see everybody in this room. You know, even when I go to like interior designer conferences, I, well, I used to go, I don't go mm. anymore. But even when I went to interior designer conferences, I was like, this is great information. This is, this is great, you know, networking. But when you get behind the scenes and you say, hey, where can I get this fabric from? No one wants to give up their source. Everybody wants to be unique, special, different, so no one wants to give up their source. Mm. You know, like um, I, I was in North Carolina and I was trying to learn how to upholster. And it was hard. It, it was very, very hard. So yeah. I got to a point where I can do little stuff, but I can't do big stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I couldn't do big chairs. You know, so I had to go get an upholster. So I asked everybody, I was like, hey, you know, where can I find an upholster? And no one would give me their sources. You know, or they gave me the number of a guy that screwed them in the past, whose prices were stupid high, and I was like, "What the hell?" Like, like I've never been in a business where no one wanted. Like, it was so closely guarded. Yeah, that's weird. So, artists can be kind of strange like that, though. Because yeah. They're, I think a lot of people are afraid of being copied because I think deep down, they're afraid that that they're not really original or something. Right. You know, like especially if they're, you know, I'm buying this guy's. For, uh, this guy's um, designs of cloth or whatever the fabric right. and if somebody else can just go and buy that same fabric and that's the only thing that makes me unique then then where's my business or whatever no the business is you get to experience the Kevin Fuller mm-hmm <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's what I sell mm hmm it's like I, I sell great furniture I sell great art but you get to experience the Kevin Fuller you get to experience working with the Kevin Fuller you know if you want to go buy it from somebody else go ahead yeah they can you know, there's no magic to what I do. Mm -hmm. The only magic I have is I enjoy it. Mm. That's the only magic is I love what I do and I'm passionate about it. You That's know? awesome, man. And like, you know, I've, I've, um, I've dated people and they're like, so what makes you excited? And they're like, like furniture, soccer, coffee, cigars, sneakers. That's about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> fit in some, and sex. Like, you know, <laughs> fit in somewhere in those six. We'll, we'll be a we'll be a great match. <laughs> That's awesome. Dude. That's awesome. We'll, we'll be we'll be a great match. That's great. You know, but um, I don't get excited by a lot of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I told I was like, hey, someone wants to interview me on podcast, and all my friends were like, oh my god, it's your first interview, and then I was like, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, great. Never thought about that like that. And they're like, well, you can use the content for this, and you can do this, and you can put it on your website. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Meanwhile, four years in business, there's no website to be seen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm like still, I'm still in infancy. I'm still playing. You know, I think it was to my advantage. I came from a business world to an art world, but mm -hmm. I enjoy the art so much. Sometimes I forget it's business. Yeah, definitely. There's, like I said, two sides to that coin. Right. To go back for a second, mm -hmm. um, when did you kind of get into art? Because I know you talked about you, you went to Germany, you got to experience like this whole other side that frankly most people in america are never even going to experience most, right. pe most americans don't even have a passport right, <laughs> right. They've, they've never like visited five states away let alone flown over the, the ocean right and so obviously like were you doing art over there were you what what, what kinds of stuff were you into I over had, there i had no clue when i was in germany i did um me and my buddy we we did some dj stuff Mm. Uh, in Germany, um, sold candy when I first got there, sneakers, um, drinking. I was really heavily into drinking because <laughs> the drinking age was so low. Yeah, like, you can buy no beer drink. there at like 16 or something. Whenever. Right? Yeah. Yeah, just walk in and buy it. Yeah, no one so, cares. Like, I, that, that's, that's where I was. And I was always in the business, you know. Always trying to sell stuff. <sighs> it's not that sell stuff. I like the concept of building something and hiring people. Mm -hmm. or building something and then watching it grow 
mm-hmm. you know. But yes, in the end of the day, everybody is a salesman. Mm-hmm. But to get back to your question about how did I get into art, mm-hmm. um, again, 13, electronic environments closed. And I was like, what the hell am I going to do next? And, you know, I've always kind of been a, a bit of a tight ass. Like, I'm very introverted, mm-hmm. you know, very, very, very introverted. Like, I think you may be the fifth person that's been to my house. Wow. You know, and I've lived here almost a year now. Wow. Like, I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's no problem. It's not that. I, it's not that. Um, I feel you. Yeah, yeah I'm I, just. I'm not the biggest person to invite people over to the house right. either. Like, I'd rather, like, let's go out and, and do something. Right. Do right. something interesting. Experience something new or whatever. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. That and, I don't know. I've just never. I've always looked at the concept of, like, Superman or Batman. Like, their house is, you know, it's their bat cave or that, um, or Superman's Fortress of Solitude. Mm-hmm. It's not the place to come party and bring folks and and people just come hang out at my house. Like, mm-hmm. No, I'll come hang out, you know. And then also this, you know, my personality, like, I hate talking on the phone. That's, that's, that's just, that just drives me crazy, especially when you're, can, you're asking me a yes or no question. Just text me. Mm-hmm. Just <laughs> Send me a text. And a lot of my friends know, they're like, all right, if they, if they want to see me, they text me and say, let's meet for lunch. Let's mm-hmm. meet for coffee. Because I don't mind talking to people face to face, but holding the damn phone, it's awful. Yeah. I hate that too, man. Like, I, I, I think some people want to talk on the phone to feel important too. Mm. Like, they constantly that want... That could be it. Like, they, I don't know, for whatever reason, like, holding that phone, right. like, I don't know. Some people mm. are... Well, obviously, people are addicted to their phones, but also, like, the phone call thing is weird. Like, I think they they feel like they're getting business done all the time right. or something. It's like, I, I'm, I'm the same way with you, man. I'd rather meet and talk in person. Right. And that's why I love this podcast, Talking in Person, because there's a lot of podcasts where they do it over Skype mm-hmm. or, you know, all that. And, and I just, when I listen to podcasts like that, I, I feel a disconnection. Mm, right. Like, I don't feel like a fly on the wall. I feel like I'm getting... Right. I'm I'm just as disconnected as those two people. Whereas, right. like with this conversation, hopefully the listener, um, we're kind of breaking the 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 wall here. <laughs> right. Hopefully right. they feel like they're kind right. of just chilling with us, listening to have exactly. this conversation. That makes sense. You know. That makes sense. And so that's why I love doing them in person. You know, because yeah. we could have easily done this over Skype or something. Right. You know, we didn't like we were talking. It we're not the closest in proximity, but mm-hmm. it's worth it for me because well, I appreciate it. And especially like even just. Even just the little things, like hearing the hearing the click of the lighter or something, <laughs> right. like and right. it, or even like, oh, sorry, I dro-, you know, right. you can you can tell just by the little background things that right. we're we're here physically in person, right. and and there's a connection that you don't get when you're is cool. over over the internet or over the phone or something yeah. like that. Which is cool, but I, I gotta remember, I gotta answer your questions. So um. no worries, dude. It's not an inter- <laughs> it's not an interview. Uh, okay, but 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 yeah. But, but I, I yeah, you know. I want this podcast to reach millions. Of and, course, you know, dude. It I want will. you to be successful. I appreciate you know, it, man. I, I appreciate it. I'm always open to help artists and people that want to do something. I really appreciate that, man. So, so 13, I, we closed electronic environments. The IRS was on my ass. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, my business partner um, went to work for another company, so he was, you know, like oh yeah, dude, let it fall. That's cool. It's, we're not gonna burn, oh, the, house. We're not gonna burn the house down. We'll be all right. I didn't want to drop it on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ash on the chair. That's a big party foul. Well, yeah. Well, but this chair is gonna be reupholstered, so you're fine. There we yeah, go. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah, ash yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be Sorry. fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> so um, yeah, my business partner had moved on, and like you know, I loved having employees, but like when the company closed, I realized they were just that. They were just employees. Mm. Like you know, like. No one was like calling me saying, "Are you okay?" Mm. You know, like I've did fed clo- families for years. Did it close badly? Like you said, you lost the company earlier. It what- did. It mm. did. We had a, a, a company that we built a we built a elementary school for, wow. and they owed us, you know, a lot of money. You know, because you were setting up all their electronics. And we were everything. doing. We were doing. We did the whole electrical on the wow. school, and the general contractor stopped paying us, and you know. Not to get into construction, but the clause we had with the county was if we stopped working, not only could the general contractor sue us, but the school itself and that county could sue us. So we were like, what do we do? You know, do we pay lawyers or do we pay to get the school done? And honestly, I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did the right thing. Like my business partner and I sat down, we're like, it's elementary school. Like 
well, we're not going to screw it. Like, even though everybody else screwed us, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to screw an elementary school. Mm-hmm. Like, we're not going to do that. You know, so we put all our resources into getting it finished. You know, we put all our resources into hiring, to keeping our employees. You know, we, keep, we put all our resources, like personal resources, into making sure the IRS was, like, at base so we can take care of employees. Like, you mm-hmm. know, even though the company closed, it closed with a smooth landing. That's good. You know, like, my employees knew ahead of time, yo, I'm closing. Like, January 1st comes, there is no more coming back here. You know, my landlord, he knows, like, my landlord... I paid him out, made sure we were good, you know? Mm-hmm. So he was, he was ecstatic. Like, I don't, I'm a, pe- although I'm an introvert, <laughs> I'm a people person, so I don't like burning bridges unless I just have to burn the bridge. Mm-hmm. I'm with you, man. You know, so, like, we did the right thing. And, and not so you can manipulate it later. Right. It's just, like, you got to be a good right. person. Right. And, and and you don't want to have people that have a vendetta against you or something. Right, right. And there's folks that have... There, well, maybe one or two people that don't like me. But that's okay, um, in, like as far as construction wise, and that's fine. But like, we did the right thing. We absolutely did the right thing, you know. And then we had some contracts that we had, and um, some clients that we had, and we actually took the clients to another company. Like mm. we, we let we let them buy the contracts from us, and we ran the contracts. And they ripped us off about thirty grand, you know. But mm-hmm. I didn't like. I don't wake up like fuck you, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you and your kids. That's, that's <laughs> you know, that, that's. I was like, you know, I learned thirty thousand dollars worth mm-hmm. of stuff. You know, I. I that's know a good way of looking at it, right? You know, I know we're jumping around, but I went to college for like two years, and I was just bored to fucking death. Where'd you go? I went to Norfolk State in Virginia. I was I was bored to death. Did your parents want you to go, or was it? <sighs> My parents. That's a good question. You know, I think they assumed I was going to college, you know, because like I hung around a lot of studious kids, mm-hmm. you know, because they had the good drugs. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to be, to be honest, frankly honest, that's like, how it you know, is. Like they had the best stuff because their parents were rich. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, so they just assumed like all my friends are going to college, I'm going to college, you know, some, but they were like, you know, you're either going to, you know, go to college. Or you're gonna get a job, or you're gonna go to the military, you know, or you're gonna become an entrepreneur. And Mm -hmm. I was like, really? You know, so my parents have always pushed entrepreneurship on me. That's cool. And and not in a negative way, but in a good way. Yeah, of course. You know, get all the education you want, go use it for yourself, not for anybody else. What what um, What does your mom do, just out of curiosity? My mom's an accountant. Okay. She retired from the CDC not too long ago. Wow. Yeah. CDC. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of news yeah. around the CDC. I don't know if you heard right about now. some that yeah. they banned a bunch of words or something. Yeah, this, <laughs> oh, that's a whole other podcast. Man. Yeah, we don't need to. We didn't need to get into <laughs> that right now. But podcast. but um, that's that's cool, man. Because yeah, my it, it's weird how like we were saying at the beginning, your parents obviously play a huge role. Oh yeah. In in how you view the world, because right. you tend to look at at the world through their lens. Right, because you're and when you're young, you're still developing what your lens is, you know, and I think a lot, you know, unfortunately, people grow up, their their parents are kind of maybe they maybe they are liars, maybe they're maybe they steal, maybe they're right, maybe maybe they're the type of guy that screws somebody over in a business deal or whatever, right, and so you tend to like view that as a normal thing, and that sucks. It really does. It it really really does yeah. suck. I think a lot of parents, though, like especially the current generation that's going to college, I think most of those parents really just want their kids to go to school because they just think like that's the next step. Right. And like they want the best for them. Right. But a lot of times I talk to kids all the time because I was the same way. I went to school. I went to college for one year and I just, you know, through a series of a bunch of stuff, I just realized it wasn't for me and I, I left. But You know, so many kids reach out to me and they're like, damn, dude, like, I wish I had the balls to do that. Or like, dude, my parents would kill me or whatever. And it's kind of like, you Yeah, you you got to write your own path. You got to write your own path. I think like, you know, well, another thing I had, I had advantage of was like, my uncle uh, owned a publishing company, you know, he used to always make us read. Mm. So one of the things I remember him telling me, he was like, he's like, "You you know, this is the only country where all information is in one location and you can go get it whenever you want to and use it. And I was like, what? He was like, the library. 
this is before Google, kids. Of course. Way before Google. <laughs> you, know, you know, he's like, everything you want to learn is in the library. Mm-hmm. Anything you want to learn in college, it's at the library still. You know, like books that run a business, books on businessmen. And I was like, what? You know, so I started reading like, you know, autobiographies of business, of businessmen, how to do business, you know, think and grow rich, you mm, know, Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Good book. You know, so like, and it was in the library. I was like, okay, so give you $15,000 a year so you can tell me if I pass or fail, or I can go learn at my own pace at the library, you know, for free. Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, everyone thinks education costs money. Education is free, mm-hmm. you know, and now that we're, we're a global flat economy, all education is free if you're not lazy, if you just go look for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, um, I know we're jumping around, but like I mentor kids around business. That's awesome, you know? man. Like one kid's 11, you know, and she That's came so to me cool. with a written business plan, you know, for a slime business. Like she's 11. For what business? A slime. You know, the kids that are in the slime and stuff like that. That's nowadays. so funny. Yeah. So like she came to me with that, and then another kid. I was at his school, t- his school talking or um, speaking. I was a guest speaker at their school, and he wants to start a t-shirt company at sixteen. I was like, okay, do it, you know. And like I literally send them links from Google, YouTube, how to do it, mm-hmm. you know. Like like it's free. The podcast, you know. I listen to a lot of different podcasts on. Like, you know, my sister, and, oh, yeah, I know, I have a lot going on, but my sister and I um, are starting a real estate company. Nice. You know, our parents already own houses, so we're going to start, you know, buying more houses, buying more units. We want to go into personal care homes, things like that. And I was like, so how am I going to do this? Oh, fuck, Google, YouTube, mm-hmm. <laughs> call realtors, yeah, associations, mm-hmm. all free. Like, like, there's, being an American citizen, there are no more excuses. Everything is free. And people are afraid, like like you were talking about earlier, with the furniture designers that are that are very guarded with their right. information. They're afraid to put it out there because they're afraid. But like the people that are putting out that content are are the they're going to be on the right side of history, right? Because those realtors that gave you that information, they're now establishing themselves as the expert in the field. Exactly. You look up to them. Exactly. You're like, wow, this guy has the blueprint. And if that guy puts out a product like some, you know, a um, couple hundred dollar product that teaches you a step-by-step thing, you might buy that. Right, exactly. And like, that's, that's, how, that's how I'm, I'm looking at podcasts right now is because some people are, it, it, it's out there, the information how to make a podcast, but there's some people that are weird about it. They're like, right. they, they have their own podcast, they have their own thing, and you ask them questions and they're, they're not really keen to help you. And it's like, dude, I'm trying to help as many people get a, a podcast going as possible. Right. Because it just, it, you know, like I said, it's not a zero sum game. Right. I think the more podcasts, the better. And and also, there's a lot of people making really crappy podcasts. All you got to do is focus on making yours the best. Right. And and the good shit rises to the top. Like it doesn't really matter. Right. And I think you're doing it the right way. Like you know, it's it's all about what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a hundred. What is it? A hundred billion people or something stupid number. Yeah. On the planet, you know, you only need like point zero 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 one percent of the world. To like your stuff. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't you don't need. Yeah, I, I've I've talked to my brother about this because uh, it's I love traveling as well. Me and my brother, we were um, we went to this big music festival last summer. Where? Um, in uh, Belgium, called Tomorrowland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh-huh. it's it's pretty awesome. And uh, we were before the festival, we went to uh, Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. Amsterdam's awesome. Mm-hmm. Probably my favorite city in the world. Not only just because of, you know, legalization yeah, of yeah, everything, yeah. but it's an amazing city. Yeah, it's pretty. It's For anyone pretty. who hasn't been yeah. there, I've talked about it plenty of times on this podcast, but I love Amsterdam. But anyways, we were there, and he's my younger brother. He's like three years younger than me. And uh, we, were, we, were ta- we were walking and talking. He's like, dude, we need to move here. Right. And I was like, well, you know, if we move here and we try to get jobs here, it's going to be difficult because mm-hmm. you're going to have to work kind of either like something in the service industry, being a bartender, right. barista, something like that. Right. It's not going to be very fun. Right. Living in Amsterdam is expensive if you want to have a cool place, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of dope spots in Amsterdam that you could live and they're not cheap, I've looked. And, uh, well, for on a, on, a, on a service job, you right. wouldn't be able to really pay for it. And so I was telling them, like, we either need to figure out how to provide a lot of people 
with a little bit of value. And that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast, providing right. tons of people with just some entertainment, a little bit of value, all that, or like niche down super hard and figure out how to give a few people like massive value. Right. And, and uh, I don't think that that's really taught. You know, you just, you're just taught to like go get a job and, and somebody is gonna take care of you. Right. And we're kind of just taught like a job is owed to you. Right. But no one thinks about like, okay, what real, what real value am I bringing to people? Right. Like, what am I actually doing? If I'm just sitting in this office, does anyone give a shit? Right. Or am I just like throwing around numbers on a computer and goofing <laughs> exactly. off? Exactly, uh, that's what it is. And that's what, that's what I don't like about consulting. You know, like a lot of the people that, that I consult for, brilliant people. You know, the last company I was with, the president was like, you know, he's got his MBA. You know, he used to be at a college as a dean of a college, but he's calling me to help him build his, you know, low voltage because he knows the books. He was awesome at the numbers. He didn't know the business, mm-hmm. you know. And the thing I tell everybody is it's all about people. You know, even as introverted as I am, if I need to turn on and, and meet somebody, I meet somebody. And the connections I make last forever. Whether we talk every day or not, like, I have friends for life everywhere mm-hmm. because, you know, people. You know, it's all about people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I, I tell people all the time, I was like, yeah, you know, like people hire me and they have tons of degrees. I have none, but I know the business. Exactly. You know, even when I was, even when I had my own business, people used to always laugh. Well, you don't have a college degree and you don't have this. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I have an accounting degree. I, ha- I have my, um, my law degree. Uh, let's see what else I have. I have my project management degree. Um, and I was, t- I was telling them I have a couple other degrees. And they're like, well, no, you don't. You didn't finish school. I was like, I pay the accountant. I pay the lawyer. I pay the project manager. Those are my degrees. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I was like, yeah, you, you look at it wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's all about who you have on your team. Exactly. I was talking with my friend Katya. I had her on my podcast recently, and she's uh, a brilliant with systems, helping mm-hmm. businesses set up systems so that they can automate mm. a lot of different parts of their business. Right. She's brilliant with that stuff, and um, she was talking with me because we're we're talking about. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start consulting podcasts and helping right. people set up their podcasts. And, you know, I kept saying all these, like, self-defeating things. Like, well, I know I'm not the best. Or, like, I know I'm not. She's like, look, look, look. There are people that have no idea how to even get to the level that you're at. Even though you might not be the best. Right. You're already light years away from somebody who knows nothing. You know how easy it is to be the best? <laughs> right? Try. Right? It's all you have to do is, is try. Right. If you want to do something, do it. Yeah. You know, and you'll become the best because nine times out of 10, even if you're like at the first step of buying your recording device, you still beat a million people who want to be in podcasting who don't have not bought the recording device. Mm -hmm. So you can consult on, okay, what's what's the best recording device to buy? Mm -hmm. Because there's there's that level, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, how many followers you have on Instagram? Like 24,000, something crazy. It's not that many, but I'm at like 5,000 right now. Okay, or 5,000. Still. 5,000 still. You know, you can teach people who are at 100 how to get to 5,000. You know, Mm -hmm. at every step in business, you have something you can offer to somebody. You know, and the bigger you get, the more things you have to offer. But like nine times out of 10, a lot of people I talk to are coach. I'm just coaching them just to try. Mm -hmm. That's so true, man. (laughs) Just to step out there. Like, I'm right. I'm not giving them no secret sauce. I'm just telling them to try it. Mm -hmm. Go. I think a lot of people just need that permission. Right. Like, that's why I think a lot of people, I don't know if you're familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk. Of course. Yeah, I was going to say. I Every day. Like, I feel like you would be. <laughs> Every day type I listen of to him. Yeah. I was going to say sneakers and motivation mm-hmm. right there. But yeah, that Gary V always talks about that. It's like people ask him stuff and he's like, you already know the answer to this, man. Like, right. you just need the, you just need me. You, you already know I'm going to say you should go for it. Right. And people need that permission to like actually chase their dreams. Because I think so many people are content with just staying where they're at. Right. And the people around them are content with staying where they're at. And, and if you start to do abnormal things, people are going to look at you and say, like, wait, why, why, why are you being so extra? Why are, you, right. why are you going out of your way to do all this? Right. You know? Because you're scared to just try. A lot of people are just scared to try. Mm-hmm. You know, like the first chair I ever did, and I'll show you in the house. Yeah. I still have it. Like, it wasn't that great to me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, point, I only need point zero 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 point one percent to like it. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and Matt and I used to joke all the time. It's like, you know, how do you become something? You just tell people you are. Yeah, that's, that's so true. That's like what Matt did with, with his podcast stuff. Right. He, like, he, it was funny. Like when we sat down to do the um, my, my podcast, he was he was like, wait, you can plug this thing into there and get power. You don't have to rely on AA batteries. He's like, why wasn't I doing this? And then, right. You know, it was, and it's something. I, and I was thinking right. like, oh, that's funny, man. But like to me, it was just something I, I just was like, oh, yeah, it's a USB thing. And, and he was like, dude, that makes things so much easier or whatever. Right. And and. But Matt knows tons of other stuff about podcasting because he's done it for like three or four years right. that I'm not going to know until I experience that. Right, right. You know, and so it, it, I love that, man. There's always something you can learn from somebody else. And, and that's... Yeah, that's if you just open yourself to it. Exactly, you know? exactly. And it's, it's, like you said, being abnormal and mm-hmm. taking lots of shit, mm-hmm. you know, and then people catch on like late, later. Yeah. You know, like I'm at a point in my furniture now, I'm not making tons of money yet. Mm-hmm. But like I lear- I've learned how to manage clients now, you know, so I went like three years. I wouldn't take clients. I would just build stuff and sell it as art. And mm-hmm. It takes longer and it, it, my cash flow sucked. But now I'm at a point I know how to manage clients. Mm-hmm. I know how to manage clients. And because someone didn't teach me how to manage clients, I know how to manage clients the way I want to manage clients that fit my business. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Totally. You know, like like experience teaches you more than books sometimes. And when and for me, like I'm so in tune about like what I want to do and what I want for me nowadays. Like I try to create everything on my terms. Mm-hmm. Like how can I do this on my terms? Like ma- again, like managing clients. I want to manage them my way, not what the book told me to do, but my way. And mm-hmm. I want people that are going to accept my way. If not, okay. I think is a lot of that is just all about like setting the expectations ahead of time. So mm-hmm. your clients know exactly what to expect and you know exactly what to expect from them. Right. And, and like setting that up beforehand is crucial. And like I said, you know, you get the pleasure of the experience of the Kevin Fuller. <laughs> you know, the outcome is you're going to have dope furniture. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's, how, that's how I look at it. And like anything, man, fame become, comes way before the fortune. Mm. you know way before the fortune and like like 2017 i know we're, we're st- i still need to answer the story how i got here but 2017 was a great year for me you know mm-hmm. like i i worked with three different artists you know two of which created the fabrics that i use on on, on chairs which was awesome you know? so, so now i'm a furniture designer and i have custom fabric that literally no one can get <laughs> Because I'm working with artists. And my thing was like, like I used to always, in, in getting to the process of becoming an artist, I used to always meet artists who didn't, they only knew one stream of income, mm. selling their painting. You know, and I was like, so why don't we print this on fabric and put it on furniture? You know, and I was like, even if the furniture doesn't sell, you now can print fabric that someone else might be inspired to use some other way. Mm-hmm. That's another stream of income for you. Mm-hmm. So that was my that was my thing of why I wanted to work with artists like like the kid Quake Solo, like uh, not anything that I have recently, but I'm gonna do a chair with one of his pieces. That would be sweet, right? You know, I, I'm gonna do a chair with one of his pieces. There's another artist I work with, Cosmo White. We did airplane seats. I saw so, that. Right. It was like yeah. the, it had the like kind of Chinese mm-hmm. vibe to it. Yeah, we, like went for floral. Old, we went for an old grandma vibe. Then, I like and, it. And then he put the plastic it like floral on floral kind exactly, of. Exactly, exactly. I like on, that. On airplane seats. Mm-hmm. You know, well, that chair, the, that set was actually in his art exhibit at the MoCA. You know, like. That's dope. My, fur, my furniture that I helped design has been in, you know, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia. That's you, crazy. You, you, I mean, like, like, it gets no bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, it is going to get bigger. But I'm mm-hmm. just saying, like. That's not what I saw in the cards. Like I did not see in the cards like creating a piece with Melissa Mitchell. You know, I did not see in the cards creating with with different artists. Like, mm-hmm. like, how can I be different? What can I do differently? You know. So when I go to a client, I can say, "Tell you what, not only can I do the chair for you, I can get you fabric no one on earth can find because we're designing it." Mm-hmm. You know, you, you you can't you can't beat that. Yeah, you know, so. that, I like that idea of how can you create the multiple streams? Because like you said, a lot of artists are not good business people. Right. A lot of good business people are not good creatives. Exactly. And so when you can somehow blend those two together, like licensing whatever that thing you you've right. created. Like for example, I watched this guy on YouTube, um, Salamandrin. 
he's like mm. a car vlogger kind of dude. Okay. And one of his buddies that they go around with, he has this kids backpack company called Puku Pals. <laughs> okay. And they're these dope backpacks for kids that are like made of leather, mm. but they have these like character themes. So like one mm. of them is like this dope little like monkey backpack. Uh, that's like a little he's like an astronaut monkey another one is like an owl like they're these like really Very cool high quality backpacks for kids because a lot of backpacks for kids are really shitty right and just like the zippers break and right. like they don't make them high quality to last right. so anyways now they're starting to like license the characters and gonna make they did a deal with incipio for phone cases so oh, like the, cool. like puku pals phone right. cases, all this very kind of cool. stuff and a lot of people wouldn't think that they're, they're like okay now i know the backpack so like let's just keep going on this backpack thing right. but they were like, okay, now that we've created these characters and kids like the characters, oh, now we can make stuff that adults and kids can wear together. Exactly. Like, oh, the dad and kid have exactly. a matching backpack or whatever. Exactly. Like, dope exactly. stuff like that. And that's what it's about. Like, you know, I was told someone the other day, I was like, artists create the world, businessmen just manage it. Because businessmen have no creative, mm -hmm. you know, they just manage it. I'm fortunate. Like, I was like, I think I've always been a creative type, but... I was forced to be a businessman. Mm, like it was suppressed. Right, right. And I, and think I didn't a, know that. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot more people are creative, but they've never flexed that muscle. Right. And so it's uncomfortable for them. Right. Just like the first time you do an, an exercise or something, you might not have the form exactly right and it doesn't feel right. But then once you repeat it over and over, exactly, you can do that. Like the first time I did deadlifts, exactly. it was like really awkward. Like I couldn't get the hinging of my yeah. hips right. And like, oh, I was scraping yeah. my knees or whatever. Yeah. But now that I've done it, like I feel, I feel natural and I can do more weight and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's a great analogy. Like, you know, just you get good. Everyone's like, well, how'd you get good? I just tried and I kept exercising the muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, creative, well, that's 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 a good way to look at it. Creative creativity to me is a muscle, mm. and you got to keep using the muscle to get better. For sure, you don't use the muscle, you die. Like, and I had no clue I was creative at all. Like, never. I can't draw. I literally can't draw. Like the stuff I design. Like, I wake up in the middle of the night. I'm like, oh shit, that would look good. I think my saving grace. Well, not my saving grace, but one of the things I contribute to my designs is that. My memory is incredible. My my visual memory is incredible. Hmm. So there's like there's like fabric stores. If they don't change the store around, I could walk in the store and go to exactly what I'm looking for. Like you know, I'll go into fabric stores. I'll put my headphones on. I'll walk for an hour or so, and I'll literally memorize everything in the store, wherever it is, you know. And then I'll memorize all the furniture I have, and literally, I could be reading a magazine. I'm creating something. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I saw this fabric, it can go with this chair, it can do this, well, maybe this, well, maybe this is better, well, maybe this is better, well, maybe this, 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 hmm. You know, like, that's how I create. Mm -hmm. It's like from, from memory, like memorizing what I have and memorizing everything I have access to. Interesting. And the more fabric I get access to, the more I memorize, mm -hmm. you know. That's dope. So it, it, it's weird. Yeah. It's, it's really, really weird. Like, you know, Because you would think that you would need to be able to draw it out or right. whatever. I've heard... Um, who was it? I think it was the singer for The Doors. Mm -hmm. He couldn't play any instruments. Mm. He only sang, but he all, but he was the songwriter. Right. So he would come to the, he would come up with some sort of melody in his brain and come back to the guys and right. be like, "Yo, I yep. thought of this is ba da 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 da," and come mm -hmm. up with like a riff, and they would be like, "Oh, like this," da -na 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 -na. Right. And, and he'd be like, "Yes, yes," and like he would compose it all. He had it in his brain, but he couldn't even play any instruments. Exactly. Which is, like, you know, sometimes. People would think, ah, I can come up with, with dope stuff in my head, but like I can't draw, so right. I can't make this and that or whatever. Was, and that was my frustration in the beginning. I was like, I can't make it. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, like getting it out of your head, I was like, yeah. I know what I want to do, like, but I can't. How? Yeah. How do I get it out of my head? How That's how I was head? with this podcast too, man. Yeah. Like I had the vision for it. Right. And like now I'm here sitting with you, but right. like six months ago... I was still figuring it all out, finding the right recorder, exactly. figuring out the technology part, getting it on iTunes, all exactly. that kind of stuff. Exactly. And now, like, my partner in the business and um, my upholster, and, uh, this kid named Andrew, that's here, Good that's name. here locally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, that, that's, that's my buddy. That's, that's like my, that's my ace. Like, I couldn't do this without him. Mm -hmm. And if you met him, he's like super introverted. Like, you know, if you if you didn't know him in high school, you're not hanging out with him now. Oh, this is business. <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah. like, like super introverted. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we go over there and like, 
literally, you know, there's veggies for breakfast, and then we sit and we try to figure out like what we're, what, what we're gonna make. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's dope. You know, but like we've been working together now for like three years, so I can bring him fabric and a chair, and in five minutes he I. I can't even describe what I want, but he gets it. He's like, oh, you want this, this, and this. I'm like, yes, yes. You know, so like, it's, it's invaluable to have a good team around you. Mm-hmm. And a good team of people that, that can understand your vision and patient enough to pull your vision out. And when me and Andrew met, we met on Craigslist. Like, I was like, fuck it, these people aren't gonna help me find an upholster. I'm gonna figure it out. So I went to different upholstery companies, knocked on doors, and I was like, eh, eh. Vibe is bad. Don't want to work with you long term. Mm-hmm. You know, not feeling you. So like, stuck I, in their old ways right, and all that kind of stuff. Right. Not, so, try, not trying to do anything kind of new exactly, or different. Exactly. And I was like, well, this is what I'm about. This is what I'm creating. I want to create furniture. I'm a new designer. They're like, oh, okay. You know, and their price is astronomical. Mm-hmm. You know, even with, even with me designing furniture, like our price. Okay, our prices are kind of are getting up there, but mm-hmm. still, like, you know, it's not as bad as like these assholes that I ran into. Mm-hmm. Like, like, and so for for people that are listening and don't exactly know, so and and even for me, so an upholster, what I'm picturing is you're taking some a piece of furniture that exists and redoing the fabric on the outside and all that kind of stuff. Correct. Creating it into something correct different. Correct. Cosmetically. Correct. Do they also change like, for example, if you buy an old chair and it needs new padding or whatever? All they, of it. Okay, cool. New padding, new um, springs in the chairs. You know, we paint. Furniture now. Well, we've been painting furniture. Mm-hmm. We'll paint legs. You know, we'll mm-hmm. do different do different things. Yeah. So, gotcha. It, it's literally building. And and there's two ways of, of doing it. Like I could go and buy existing frames without all the all the fabric and everything on it, and then build from there, which is one way. But you know, you got to buy 300 frames. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I found in furniture, like most furniture does not appreciate. Well, no furniture appreciates except mine. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll explain why. Like so, like the chairs we're sitting in, like literally, you know, back in the day, these were a thousand dollars for the pair. Yeah, you for know? sure. Because someone got tired of them, I bought them for a hundred bucks for the pair. Whereas to buy these frames, each frame would cost me a hundred bucks. <laughs> mm. You know, for the fr- and I'd have to buy ten of them. You know, to get just the frame. I feel you because the people that are selling frames only sell in bulk or whatever mm-hmm. because, uh, okay, I see. Right, they only sell in bulk. They're not know. going for these one-off designers because that's not really where the money is for them. Exactly. Makes sense. I, exactly. So I, I buy, you know, frames I like and then I go from there. But um, it's, I'm, what was I saying? I was going to get back to something. We're talking about upholstery. Okay, and yeah. yeah. Working with Andrew. Yeah, so working with Andrew. So I was like frustrated that no one would want to work with me. And I literally saw an ad on Craigslist, and I called the dude, and he was like, yeah, I can do it. Like, <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. And like, we both have the same temperament. Like, we're both mm-hmm. very, oh, yeah, we're, we're both Libras. Like, we're both born, like, in the first the first few days of October. Mm-hmm. You know, he's younger than me, but we're, we're, we're both Libras, so, like, we just have a lot in common. We vibe really, really well together. So him and I met, and he was like, hey, bro, it's got to be honest with you. Like, I just left my upholstery company where I was working. And I just started my own business like yesterday. <laughs> You're like, my first client. <laughs> <laughs> now I wasn't his first client, but he was like, "Like, look, yeah. I'm not, I'm not the greatest on earth." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Well, do you want to be the best?" And he was like, "Yeah, I want to always do great work." And I was like, "Well, we can work together then." That's dope. So you know, so you have me, a new furniture designer, and him, a new upholster, pretty much like, like his own upholstery company, no longer apprenticing. For the first time and it was like, "Yo, let's make magic." That's the funny thing is, I think people always. That sounds like perfect because you were both kind of at that new stage. Right, right. A lot of people think they've got to weasel their way into something that already exists. And right. most of the time, it's it's kind of like people are like, oh, I got to get I got to get in with this crowd. And it's like that crowd's already kind of like established their thing. Like you got to come come up with some other guys right. and make your own new crowd. Exactly. Like that's a lot of times how it works. Like, you know, trying to get in with Mark Zuckerberg or something, it ain't going to happen. He's already nope. got his circle. Yep. He's already got his thing. He's yep. already made it. He's not trying to invite new people in, really. You know, I could be wrong, but, you know. You're absolutely right. And, and you got to, like, find that core group of people to come up with. You're absolutely right. And it's not just, it's in all areas of business. Like, you know, we were successful at my company, Electronic Environments, because 
we got in with project managers who just got to their company. So they're building their roster of like their electrician they want to use and, and trust, their plumber they want to use and trust. Like I always got in with those guys that were hungry mm-hmm. and were building. Like you try to get in with a guy that's been in construction for 30 years. And, yeah. You can't keep you know, teaching old dog new tricks. Right. Kind of he's, got, he's, like, he's got his electrician already. He's not going to give you a chance unless the electrician dies or blows something up or is too busy. Mm-hmm. So you're sitting around waiting. So I just, I always got with people like, all right, we're going to come up together. Like, we're going to figure this out and come together. And now, like, Andrew is like, you know, first of all, he's only, he just turned 30, which in this business, you're a baby, Mm -hmm. you know, because most of the are down like 45, 50, been doing it forever. Mm -hmm. But Andrew is like probably one of the best, you know, at creating, Mm -hmm. you know, because like I said, between him and I, if I design it, he gets it. And he, and he knows how to put it to life, but he doesn't want to design. He doesn't want to pick the fabric. He doesn't want to do that. He's like, mm. I, don't, I don't want to do that part. And you do that part. Sounds I don't like a match made in heaven. Right. He's like, I don't want to do a client. You do that part. And like, there we go. And we're both on the same page, like for, at least for me, like, like I said, I've owned my dream car. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been married twice, which was, which was cool. I'll probably get married again, you know, but for me, it's not about the trappings anymore. It's about time, mm-hmm. you know, and literally I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, how much does time cost? Yep. <laughs> you know, like I have, a, there, there's guys I know, I have one buddy in particular, he literally, he's 45, probably 47 now, works at Costco, stocking shelves, his wife's a bartender, and he's like the happiest fucker on earth. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, what, what? Like, but you're not rich. He's like, yeah, but I'm happy. He's like, mm-hmm. my kids are good. You know, I work at night, stocking shelves. I don't make bad money. I mean, he's, he's like, I'm not rich, but like, I've got a roof over my head. Mm-hmm. You know, I eat every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I can afford to drink every day. Live in America. I live in America, right. So he's like. Yeah. Like, I gotta love Tim Ferriss' book, but like, people like him, like put it in perspective, like, oh, you really can. Like, like, like your time isn't that much, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's weird, like there's this fine line and, and not everyone's created the same, man. Like I have this weird wanderlust where I wanna travel. Right. I don't necessarily, uh, I've, I've realized that right now while I'm still young, like I don't necessarily wanna be tied down to like one location stuff. Like I wanna Why? be able to move around, you know? Exactly. And I wanted to, I, I thought of this earlier and you know, there's this weird, thing with the younger generation with furniture i feel like because you know for me i'm not the type of person where i would be going out and spending a big chunk on furniture but when i look at stuff like your stuff i'm like oh okay like this is really cool this is something that i would appreciate to own rather than dropping a grand on some chairs that look like any other chairs that i've seen in in a house i think like right now with what we have with instagram what we have with with being able to see into other people's lives for the first time, like right. people that live at a level that we that a lot of people could couldn't experience or wouldn't know about, like we get to see the best of the best. Right. And so I think the current generation, you see, like kids, they're spending tons of money on sneakers. Kids were not spending two hundred dollars on sneakers right. twenty years ago. Maybe yeah, you know, were. maybe yeah. maybe, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, but you know what I'm saying? Okay, maybe not 20 years ago. Let's go back 50 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Sneakers were not right. a thing that you spent a lot of money on, but right. but because they've been marketed as this thing, you wear them every. They're functional. Yeah, that's kind of how how furniture is too. It's something that you use. We're sold to. Mm-hmm. There's a there's this this video you should check out. Just YouTube it. It's and it's it's called How to Sell to a Negro. Huh. Yeah, you know, but like. When I watch the video, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But now everybody thinks like that. So it's not only how to sell to that that demographic, it's how to sell to everybody. Because it wasn't about like, it, it, was, it was very basic. It was like, give them good customer service. You know, they're gonna spend, just help them spend it. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas like, that's society in general. <laughs> mm-hmm. not, not, just, not just black people, that's society in general. It's so like you said with sneakers, they've become so cool now because they've been marketed to be cool. We buy it, mm-hmm. you know? I had a Volkswagen, I had a Porsche. The Porsche was awesome, 
Volkswagen does the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. I get everywhere. It's built on the same chassis, <laughs> even. <laughs> right. Even built on the same chassis as the McCann. So I'm like, yep. like I still get from A, from a to Z, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I it's have, true, man. I still have, like, my iPod connections. I still have, like, Sirius and, like... Yep, yep. Why? Exactly. And I think the, the, the generation that's growing up with all these things, Instagram and all this stuff, they're realizing, like, I don't need to drop tons of money. Like, for me, at least, the stuff that I'm going to drop money on is stuff that, number one, experiences. Mm-hmm. People want to drop money on that because that's something that you can't really put a price tag on at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. But something that's kind of like a one-off type of thing or mm-hmm. something that other people cannot have. So like, for example, I saw on your on your Instagram, you, you had those uh, Krispy Kreme NMDs mm. on there. You were like, those are sick. Those were like some custom sneakers for people that are listening. Um, it was these uh, Adidas NMDs that someone had custom colored to look like a Krispy Kreme box. Exactly, and, that, and they're sold. They were, they were a uh, collab with Krispy Kreme. Really? If I can find them, I will, I will pawn a lot of my shit to buy them. Yeah. yeah. They were awesome. But they're 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 unique. Mm-hmm. And you're right. It's, it's about experiences. Exactly. It's and like, it's dope and as a conversation starter, exactly it's something right. that not everyone has. And although I'm into sneakers, like I'd never buy sneakers everyone else has. Mm-hmm. You know, like Jordans are great, they're fucking uncomfortable as fuck. Yeah. I don't know if you've owned Jordans or not, but they're <laughs> <laughs> I've tried them on just to see what the hype is about. Like Jordan ones, like I've never really right. appealed to me that right. appealed to me that much. But yeah, like they're uncomfortable. And I have like two, three, four, five. <laughs> six seven and eight they're all uncomfortable that's hilarious you know and the shoes i wear every day are like my adidas runners Mm -hmm. you know so i buy stuff that like either no one is not everyone is buying like i'll I'll refuse to buy yeezys everyone has them yeah the 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 yeezy thing is kind of dying for me especially like and you, you can see that in the resale values too. Like the newest right. ones are only reselling for a little bit over what the retail was. Exactly. The hype has kind of died out. And even even Kanye said, he's like, eventually I want it so everyone can can get a pair. Right. Which which is cool. Which is great. Which is, which is awesome. They're really comfortable shoes. Which, like they're cool looking right. shoes. Which is awesome. So even like in, in furniture, like again, modeling everything about after who I am and what I like, I want somebody who wants that one off, who doesn't care if it's $5,000 or a hundred dollars, it's one off. Mm-hmm. You know, like my recent shoe purchase was like the Nike Dunk Californias, the 2014. I saw those on your Californias. Instagram. Yeah, that was my recent purchase. Those were dope. Like I literally paid a hundred bucks for them, you know, but like nobody in any circle I'm in will have those. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, and they were only a hundred bucks, mm-hmm. you know, and, I, and then what I found in furniture is like, like looking through all the Instagrams, Everything's gray. Everything's blue. Everything's white. Everything's gray. Everything's blue. Everything's white. Everything's black. You know, it's like the same colors over and over and over again. And like my client is that client who's like, you know, they did Ikea when they graduated from college, Mm -hmm. you know, and now they want something special for them. You know, Mm -hmm. they're they're ready to spend $1,500 to $2,500 on a chair, Mm -hmm. you know, from rooms to go. But then they get there and like, I gotta buy it's the not same special, sh- right? I gotta buy the same shit everybody else buys, mm-hmm. you know. So my my stuff cus- is in my parents' house, right? Exactly. So my customer is that that person's like, you know what? I want something cool, unique, funky, one off in my house. You know, I tell my clients, I was like, you buy a piece from me, it'll be the first time that furniture ever holds its value. Mm. You know, if mm-hmm. you buy something for twelve hundred bucks from me because no one on earth has it, it will always be worth $1,200. <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know, and that, that's, what I tell, that's, that's what I say to folks, is like, you, you, you're, you're buying an investment. Mm-hmm. You know, you use it every day, you sit on it every day, you, you can do whatever with it every day. But like, I finally hit a point in furniture where my shit doesn't, you know, it's gonna appreciate. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is clean it, take care of it. It will appreciate like a car. Mm-hmm. You know, like I've seen stuff that I've that I've done recently. I did this pair of yellow and gray chairs, and I was new in the business, and I sold the chairs for like eight hundred bucks for the pair, right? And I'm like, yeah, eight hundred dollars. Oh my god, I made them for three hundred bucks. I made five hundred bucks profit. Mm-hmm. This is awesome, you know. And then it was it was actually a furniture dealer that bought them. He sold them for twenty seven hundred dollars. <laughs> Holy shit. I was like, fuck, what? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah, they were cool, unique, original. So I marked them the hell up. And I yeah. have the clientele that want cool, unique, original. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I'm willing to give you 800 and sell it for 2700 I was like, what? He's like, yeah. So, you know. I tell, but I, he had those connections had to those somebody connections. that would be right, paying that. Right, yeah. right. And eventually I, I will as well. But, like, it makes sense. Like, you know, I'm finally, I finally figured out that, you know, I'm doing something that's going to appreciate. This is your stamp. You know, I did a pair of wingbacks for a lady. And literally they were at Andrew's house and someone came by and offered us like 1500 bucks for him. You know, someone came by and was like, yo, can you duplicate that for me? I'll pay you whatever to duplicate that. So I can't duplicate it, you know, but now these are one offs in this lady's home. And I called her. I said, hey, look, you know, I know what you pay for these shares. You know, someone wants to give you 1750 for them. She's like, no, because I want them for me because this is me. Mm-hmm. Like we designed these for me. So like, like, you know, being in a point where like um, furniture appreciates and the piece I did with Melissa Mitchell, like the idiots, I have no idea why it's not sold yet. Like people don't understand. First of all, Melissa Mitchell is like a dope ass artist, you know, not only is her stuff like on murals, but she does head wraps. She does ties. She does like, um, what was it? Pocket squares. Mm-hmm. And we appreciate like artists appreciate. So her and I did a chair together. And it's literally her art on the back of a chair, you know? And like, if you can't appreciate that or understand like how that increases in value, you're not our customer. Like, mm-hmm. like you don't get this. Like you're not only not our customer, but your way, to me, your way of thinking is backwards. Mm. Like, you know, like I come to people's houses and they want a sofa. Okay, great, it's $2,500. Yeah, but I'm gonna pay $2,500 a room is to go. I'm like, okay, you can, but with me, it's your sofa not something rooms to go built in China <laughs> mm-hmm. that they're going to sell to 500 different 500,000 different people that everyone in your that everyone in your, your income bracket wants. has yeah. like like great go to rooms to go um, mm-hmm. that's that's not my client you know mm-hmm. what i do is i do, i and like talking it out like i do stuff like i'm learning this just in this conversation like i do stuff that appreciates in value you know i'm probably one of the few furniture companies where your furniture is going to appreciate there's other great designers out there. There's other great artists out there. There's incredible furniture designers out there. But they do the same shit that everybody wants. You know, they do a gray sofa that everyone else has done a gray sofa. But their marketing is so good, you'll buy the gray sofa from them at a higher price. Uh, okay. But when you go to resell it, it's still a gray, it's still a gray sofa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That everyone else has done. They're going to end up getting rid of it for a couple hundred bucks A couple or hundred bucks, exactly. Whereas me, I'm like, okay, great. Let, let's take that. Let's build something that's you, that's going to sit in your house, that's going to go with what you what you desire, mm-hmm. you know? And then this is you. So when you go to resell this, okay, great. You might not get your $2,500 back, but you'll get $2,000. you will get $1,500 back because you have an original piece. You have a story that you're selling. We're not, it's not just furniture. You're selling a story. This is the story of you and your house. That someone is gonna want to buy because it's unique, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it's different. And people want. I'm hoping and learning and seeing that people want different. Mm-hmm. You know, I like what you said about how your client is the person that bought IKEA and now they're ready to upgrade. Like yeah. I'm all about that. Where I, I put my toe in the water of like what I like, and I'll buy something cheap. And then if I'm ready, right. and I'm like, oh, I like this. I'm ready to upgrade it. Right. It's kind of like what car companies do. Mm-hmm. We keep talking about cars, but Mercedes will get you into a C class. <laughs> right. And then when your lease is up or whatever, they're like, y- you don't want to go back down. You're like, oh, I'll, I'll go, I'll get up to an E class. And they right. work you up the brand. <laughs> right. And it's true. Right. Like, well, everyone has a C. You, you're driving around, you're like, shit, everyone's got a C class. Right. You thought you were special in the dealership. And now all right. of a sudden you're like, damn, right. that guy next to me has an E class. Or whatever. And so, like, I I like that because I'll do the same thing. For example, I bought some boots. Mm -hmm. And I I know I I didn't ever really wear boots before. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like these. I don't want to drop, like, 500 bucks on, like, a really (laughs) nice pair of boots. Right. But I'll go down and get some for, like, 80 bucks. See if I like the style. You know, they might not be the most comfortable. But once they break, okay, did I like them or not? I'll I'll upgrade and buy something that I like. Right. You know? And I think that's kind of how society is going we want the best of the best or we just want something that's going to get us from a to z kind of right. like you were saying with the car it's like right. a lot of people they'll they'll buy a, a reliable something to get a to z but then when if they realize they like that they might they might move up to something better or whatever exactly 
Exactly. And like people get frustrated. Like I, that pisses me off. I mean, you've been in, you've been through my house. You know, I told you. Even though I play with this stuff all all the time, I have a sofa. I have a bed. <laughs> A table and a computer. Yep. Uh, that's it. Yep. You know, I got four bedrooms. I have a loft upstairs that's fucking empty. Like, I don't care about this. It's stuff. Yeah, exactly. You know, if it's going to be in my house, it's going to be dope. And a lot of that stuff weighs you down, even mm-hmm. though you don't know it subconsciously. Like, if for whatever reason shit hits the fan and you want to go back to Germany or whatever, the less stuff you have, right? like, the easier it is just to let go and go. Yeah. Oh man, like I'll show you my closet later, but like, although my shoe collection is crazy, <laughs> you know, that it's not, I mean, it's, it's not as bad as it used to be, but like that I'd have to put, put away somewhere, but everything else, man, I can pack up and be in another country in 24 hours. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. And that's, that's including taking all my clothes, mm-hmm. you know, like, like I don't, you know, I've had the trappings of stuff and stuff is awesome. Don't get me wrong, folks. I love money. I love getting paid, but I want to do it on my terms now. Mm-hmm. You know, I just want to. It's not worth it right. when someone else is dictating it. Right, right. I want to. I want to do it on, on my terms. So um, that that's that's kind of where I am. You know. Mm-hmm. And again, so like going back to the, the original question. Mm-hmm. So in thirteen, when I closed electronic environments, and like I started to figure out that you know my wealth didn't come from you know. How did you even money? start that? Like, because you know, for me, like I wouldn't know the first thing about starting an electronics company. I, I didn't either. How did you get that inspiration or, or collaboration or whatever it was that started it? Mm. My business partner at the time, he came to me. And the funny thing is, I had a coffee company and I loved doing coffee. So I was doing coffee really? and creating coffee. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you some merch from that uh, before you leave. So I had a. I had, I was Were doing, you. What, what was the. Were was, you buying uh, the beans from something else mm-hmm. and then just repackaging I was them as the beans, roasting them, and then selling, selling them to different retailers? So um, it that's what I was doing. I just happened to have some cash, and I had a, I had a house, some equity, and mm-hmm. a buddy of mine came to me and said, "Hey man, let's build houses." And I was like, "I've never built a house." He's like, "You want to?" And I was like, "I got cash. Fuck it. Let's figure it out. Let's try it, dude." In the first house we did, like. We bombed miserably. We we made no money. You know, the bank foreclosed on us. Like, it was bad. What kind of house? Like was, a- we built, like, from the ground up. We were, we were going to be spec builders. Never built a fucking house in our lives, but we were going to be spec builders. And I was like, I'm a risk taker. So like, fuck it. Let's do it. Yeah. You know, I got cash. You have an idea. Let's do it. But we learned so much from that. And then after that, we, we, we went to rehabbing houses. You know, and then, like, he had electronic environments. And he was doing like home theaters and things like that, you know, mm-hmm. while we were building houses or he was running both companies or trying to run both companies. And then like we built that first spec home and then he came to me as like, dude, like electronic environments is, is wearing me out. You know, will you help me run electronic environment? So I became president of electronic environments, I think 2006. I've been, I'd been there with him in 2002 when it started like consulting and helping him build the brand or whatever. And, and again, I was working on the, the housing side because we rehabbed houses. So at that point, like once we learned the failure, we did a rehab. It bombed miserably, but we broke even. We didn't lose money this time. We broke even. That's cool. But then at that point, we knew how and to that was re- on your second house? That was our second house. Hey, that's not bad. Right. So, but, so now I knew how to rehab houses. So I was rehabbing for investors and making money. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, electronic environments was going. The economy crashed. People weren't buying houses anymore electronic environments we tried to kill that company so many times we were like we're closing it i mean a funny story real quick <laughs> that seems like a funny statement though because people would assume like you're trying to close a company just freaking close the company dude like what are you doing we couldn't because people were calling us so I was like, all right here's my idea i was like the next person that because we got into the home theater market and we were good at it and remodeling basements so then i was like look the next customer that calls us since we don't want to do it anymore i'm going to tell them it may cost them twenty five thousand dollars for the consultation fee and that $25,000 would go towards the home theater if we build it. And I was like, people stop calling us for business. We can close the company. And this doctor called me. And I remember it was like a pretty deadpan conversation. Like, you know, it's a doctor. So he's very straightforward. X and O. Like, mm-hmm. So I was like, look, man, for me to come to your house is $25,000 just for the consultation. If you like what we, do, we can do for you, we'll, we'll put it towards your, you know, 
we'll put it towards your your home theater. Mm -hmm. So it was like the consultation was twenty five grand, but if you decided to go through with it, that twenty five grand kind right. of went towards the purchase. Right. Okay. Right. So I was like, "Fuck that! We'll, we'll, it'll kill our business. We won't have to do this anymore." And he said, "Okay." And I was like, <laughs> "Fuck!" <laughs> and you can't say no to twenty five grand. You can't say no to that. So, but so then to then to your point, like, why don't you just close the company? At that point, we're like, no more. We're not doing that anymore. But then the housing economy crashed. And again, we still have these requests for electronic environments, like doing wiring. And, 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 and this was when, like 2013, you said? Nah, this was like 2004, 5, okay. 6. You, early, I think you said 2003. I thought you might have said 2013. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this was, so this, this is like home theaters are like... Oh, the, the shit. Yeah, everyone wants one. Right. And we're trying to get out of it because we want to build houses. Was this still like DVD kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Like people weren't putting any kind of like, obviously no like... Uh, Apple TVs mm -hmm. or any kind of smart TVs. It was all like this was this was you DVDs. had a stack, yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, I got you, and like projectors and mm -hmm. sound, surround sound and exactly. all that shit. Okay, exactly. And so um, the housing market crashed, and we we're like, the shit won't die. Let's keep going. And then we just started finding other avenues of which we can get into. And then 2008, we bought a company called Able Electric. So at that point, we were electrical and we did low voltage wiring, and we just kept growing the company. You know, we stopped building houses. We we're like, we make more money over here. Let's economy crash over there. Let's just do this. So we started doing electronic environments. And at one point we had, I think, like 22, 27 employees. You know, we were one of the biggest contractors out there at the airport. Did here. that feel weird that you were like somewhat responsible for like 27 oh people's God. livelihood and all that, you know? Mm. You know, if I had known about weed back then, controlling anxiety, we'd probably still be in business. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but like dude that that's like I, I tell people i didn't sleep for six years wow like six years i did not sleep because like, i'm like oh my god like if if i don't get a, the next contract i can't keep my employees he can't feed his, his wife who can't feed his kids mm -hmm. like oh shit mm -hmm. you know like sick like literally Six years, I might have slept four hours a night. Just trying to keep your head above water, just like, and and, and, and not even financially, like keep my mental head above water. Mm, mm. Like my business partner is very, he's very, very black and white. Either you have it or you don't. He's gonna sleep no matter what. Whereas me, I'm, I'm very in the gray. Like, how does this affect such and such? You know. And then I take because I'm because I'm I, I feed off energy. Like, I took it really personal. Like, mm -hmm. oh shit, like. We don't do this, then this person doesn't need this. Is, it's like I gotta lay people off. I gotta like that shit drove me crazy, it drove me insane. Yeah. You know, the trappings were awesome, but like it drove me insane. You know, not because I was concerned about my stuff. I was concerned about people. Mm-hmm. You know, like and like these people depend on us. And right. What's gonna happen if, if I close the business? And that's what I was saying earlier, like, you know, at the end of the day I found out they were just employees. They were just tools. You know, everybody that, that worked for me. All my top project managers are probably making triple what they made with me at other companies because they got the training working for me. They ain't calling me to give me a job. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you you create this big thing to hire a lot of folks. And at the end of the day, you know, I understand why CEOs aren't close to their employees because they're just tools to, yeah. make, to make the CEO money. Yeah. And, and I've heard this before. Everybody's listening to the radio station WIFM. <laughs> What's in it for me? Right, right, <laughs> right, right. And like, I never approached life that way. Like, I never approached life like, "What's what's in it for me?" Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, my friends know, man. If I have if I have a quarter, everybody's got a quarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's always been my approach. And even my I got that from my parents. Like, you know, I had so many people that spend the night at our house. Well, we had people spend the night at our house that didn't leave for years. <laughs> you know, but because that's how my parents were. Like, we have food, they don't. Okay, you can have some. That's awesome. Y you know, so that's that's always been my approach. Is like, yeah, I got it. You need it here. Yeah. You know, but like you learn harsh realities. Like it doesn't come back. Yeah. You know, but it's okay. That's yeah. It's okay because I like this is how I view it. Like for example, right now we're on this podcast. People are gonna list, be listening to this. Right. You know, and we were talking about karma. You know, like what goes around comes around. Being right. a good person. It's like if someone screws you over, right? you're not just screwing that one person over because people are going to hear about that. Mm -hmm. You know, like it may not be, it may not be a direct correlation. Like you, you screw, they screwed you over, you're going to screw them over back. But it's like, if you, if you continue to live life that way, 
people people are like, why don't people like me? Why don't why don't all this? It's like, well, maybe maybe it's not just something you you're doing consistently. Maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something that you you know the way you're living. Maybe it's the way you're acting around people. Yeah. You're not thinking about anyone else. So why does anyone give a shit about you? Yeah, it's energy you put out there. Mm-hmm. It, it it truly is. You know, and like becoming the Kevin Fuller, like it's it's definitely an energy that I, that I'm getting back. Mm-hmm. My clients don't suck. You know, I hear a lot of designers, oh my God, my client's this, my client's that. Like after that first bad experience and I decided I'm going to be the Kevin Fuller and it's going to be my way and pay me or you don't, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Like my clients fucking rock. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like trust me completely, love who I am as me and will, not only do they, do they buy my stuff, they'll refer me. They'll put me on social media. They'll tell their friends. They'll pass out my business card. And I don't even do referral fees, you know, and they're doing yeah. this. I mean, I started doing yeah. referral fees now because I, it's just a thank you, you know. Of course. But, like, like people appreciate who I am and how I do business. Mm-hmm. My clients fucking rock. That's awesome. Rock. Like, you know, I had a lady that I just did something for, and she was like, Kevin, I just want it simple. I just want, like, I want blue, a chase, and ottoman and chairs. Just a nice blue velvet fabric. And I was like... Well, you know I'm an artist. Like, I was like, you can get that shit anywhere. She's like, I know, but I want it from you. And I was like, okay, so you want me to just give you a blue chair with no artwork, no special design? She's like, yeah, because it, it's it's you, mm-hmm. you know. But then when I when I learned that, and I just learned this like this past weekend when I delivered her stuff, like people enjoy the experience of me, you know. They they enjoy. You know, that I care about their stuff. Yeah. You know. It's like, there's a thing going on, especially I think with, for example, like leather goods and like right. hand, like, for example, if you buy a wooden table from rooms to go, you have no emotional attachment to that. Right. But if you buy like from a carpenter, you know, and he made this table special, exactly. like you have an emotional attachment to that table. You know, someone took the time to make it. Exactly. You know, if you have a problem, you can reach out to them and be like, yo, can you come? Exactly. One of my legs broke. Can you fix it or whatever? And um, people appreciate that because exactly. I think so much stuff like with a with a factory farm or whatever, you're not thinking about where that cow came from. But if you were right. buying your... Or, or, or let's say eggs or something like right. one of my friends they have chickens and sometimes i take care of their chickens when they're out of town and they nope. let me keep the eggs right whenever i eat those eggs compared to the eggs i get from the store i think about it i'm like wow shit this came from one of those chickens that i was hanging out with earlier today and yeah. like you have that kind of like emotional attachment to it it, yeah. it makes it a, like kind of almost like it's pride yeah it's, it's a prideful thing people like that like and like i said like my customers don't suck you know and i was like I was disappointed because I was just doing blue fabric. Like I wasn't using the, the abundance of, of my talent to make mm-hmm. her something great. So what I did was like it forced me to find, it didn't force me, but I found the best blue velvet I could possibly find, mm-hmm. you know, because I care that much. And I felt bad that she was paying me just to do something simple. Mm-hmm. But for me, I was like, I'm going to find her the best fabric, the best blue fabric that she loves and will appreciate. Mm-hmm. And like, I deliver these again, just, and they're on my Instagram page. And like, I deliver these solid blue pieces of furniture. And this lady is in love with it. Like, in love with it. Like, she emails me and she texts me, like, this is, this is awesome. This fabric is incredible. That's awesome. You know, she's like, this is, you, you did exactly what I wanted better than I expected. And I was, and, and me in my head, I'm like, it's just blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just some blue fabric. I right. mean, I always look for the best fabric, but you right, know, right. I'm like, yeah. it's just blue fabric. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, so, but I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. Like, I touched her. Like, you know, it's not. It's not the design. It was the experience of like having me design it for her. Mm-hmm. It's the experience of me putting my care into her pro- into her project. You know, regardless of what it was. And dude, man, like. It's the, the, oh my God, you sit on this shit and it's like, it's fucking like a baby is like <laughs> wiping your ass or like, like it's incredible fabric, you know, in, yeah. incredible. And yeah. like, but in my mind, the artist, I'm like, it's just blue. Yeah. But like, again, it was the experience. It was like me, she feels the care I put into finding that. Cause I was like, I'm just not going to give you some normal blue shit. Like, we're going to find yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Cause it's also kind of like, for example, a lot, you know, 
people that are entrepreneurs, they always get upset when their friends don't support them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like a lot of, for example, my friends that are musicians, it's like, I know my friends enjoy my music, but they still are listening to other stuff. It's not my stuff, you know, or, no. or they're not supporting, you know, my thing. Right. And so I always try to support my friends as much as possible when they have a new thing. For example, my friends, uh, my friend Chad, he and his brother started a, a, an apparel company. So they have like hats and shirts cool. and stuff. And it would be one thing if they were just buying some like Gildan shirts right. and screen printing some shit on it. You know, like I'd be like, okay, whatever. But I know that he went to the trouble of finding like the most comfortable hats that he right. could find and and putting their logo on it. And right. so I know that when, for example, they came out with like a an athletic material hat that's like sweat proof so you can wear oh, it at the gym cool. and stuff, you know, it won't, won't get the sweat marks on right. it. Right, very cool. I immediately purchased it because yeah. I was like, I love all their other hats. They fit me perfectly. I know that they thought this through. They didn't just go with the first thing they found exactly. and the cheapest thing they found. And I battled that too. Like, you know, why don't my friends support me? Why don't my friends buy shit? Why don't they buy, why don't they buy more stuff from me? But it's not a, about that technically mm-hmm. you, you know like they cheer me on and that might be all the friends that's all that's all you need from them is to cheer you on mm-hmm. you know they do pass me around and refer me but like they might not buy my stuff yeah because they don't they don't get it yeah it's okay or they might not even be like whatever you you definitely have a unique style too mm-hmm. and maybe their style is more they, they don't want like their right. furniture to stand out or whatever exactly and my thing is like i support my friends regardless of what they're doing mm-hmm. you're doing what okay great it's not my cup of tea here's a couple bucks i'll support you mm-hmm. I'll, I'll promote you i'll buy your shit you know and they're not gonna always buy my stuff and i was like well i'm fucking supporting you why aren't you supporting me but it's not about that like mm-hmm. i do it now i do things because it's who i am and it's what i want to do you know like i don't i don't bitch about being me Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because because I do something doesn't mean that she's gonna do it or he's gonna do it or they're gonna do it. But I'm okay because it's what I do. Mm-hmm. That's me. I'm gonna support you. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna buy your stuff, regardless. Because that's what I do. I literally put my money and my <laughs> my actions behind my friends. Mm-hmm. That's not what you do. Okay, that's cool. I'm gonna still be the Kevin Fuller. Mm-hmm. And I love being me. That's awesome, man. Dude, and that's a big problem is a lot of people are uncomfortable with who they are and they're trying to be somebody else. You know, they see, you they know, want the marketing. To, mm-hmm. <laughs> they want the marketing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they're trying to imitate what they see or whatever. But it's like you see uh, someone who's uni- a unique creator and you appreciate them not because they copied some other style. Right. It's because you appreciate their twist on whatever it is. Right. And that's the main thing that a lot of people don't realize too is like, for example, you take snapchat mm-hmm. they did they weren't the first photo sharing app you had instagram you had facebook you had tons of other photo sharing apps right. you, you could even argue that just text messaging you could send your friends a, a picture yeah. but they put that one twist on it where it disappeared after 10 seconds <laughs> right and it and it popped off right and like you could take you know you weren't you're not the first person to invent comfy chairs or cool looking chairs but Ooh. you put your own twist on it. Right. And that's what people appreciate. Right. right. And people don't think they have something special, but but you do. Like every person listening to this, they have something to offer, no matter what. And you might not view yourself as a creative person. Oh, I can't mm. draw or whatever. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people come back to me about with this podcast and reach out and say, like, dude, this inspired me to like chase my dreams or whatever. And that makes that means so much to me. Man. And even and that wasn't even my exact intention, but I think subconsciously it is. Yeah. And that's way more than like it's more riches than than driving a Porsche. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's way more. It, it's so it's so awesome. Like it's, like you said, you were working with kids and stuff. Yeah, I, I love working with kids, and that that was a fluke. It was an absolute fluke. So um, a buddy of mine teaches he teaches entrepreneurship at a high school, and I have no idea why he teaches entrepreneurship. He's never been an entrepreneur. <laughs> He's never that always a, makes me laugh. He's never owned a business. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. I love him to death. So he called me one day. Well, my friends. Um, but is there an entrepreneurship class at this high school? Yeah, at this high school. Yeah, that's interesting. And he's teaching it, and he never ran a business. So I'm like, what the fuck? Are you teaching? That's kids? funny. You don't run a business. I'm like, that's kind of screwed. And he always asks me, what should I do next? And I was like, well, why don't you try running a business since you're teaching it? Like, try that. So, um, but yeah, so he called a bunch of my friends and they were like, hey, look, I need an entrepreneur to come speak to my school. And they're like, yo, call Kevin, call Kevin, you know? And he called me, he's like, man, I can't pay you nothing. I can't do this. And I was like, I don't care because for me, it gets me out of my mental space or whatever, even if I'm in a negative space or it keeps me moving. Mm-hmm. 
And even sometimes having that audience makes you more clear on what mm-hmm. you do. Like I'm, sh- like you were saying earlier, even just us talking right, right. now, you're kind of talking through what you what you do. Right. It gives you just putting it out loud sometimes gives you more mental clarity than you than right. you understand. Right. Like I've been struggling with like what makes me better, what makes me different. Like until you and I started talking. Mm-hmm. Like, oh shit! Yeah, I, I yeah yeah I I provide an experience. I provide something unique. I provide furniture that you know is, that can appreciate over time. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. but it takes talking to people to figure that out. Mm-hmm. So he called me. He was like, hey, man, I can't pay you. You know, can you come speak to my classes? Well, one class at first. He's like, can you come speak to my class? Okay. It was like, I, he was like, I was like, what's the topic? And he was like, um, leadership in business. I was like, uh, okay. I wrote nothing down. I did nothing. I showed up and I spoke to an hour to these kids about living their dreams. You know, like I, I realized in that moment what I did have to offer people, you know, and like I told you earlier, it's because I, I tried. Everyone's at the starting line. I'm 50 meters down because I tried, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and even with, with you, I was talking about like doing podcasts is like true. You know, might, you might not consult Gary v, Gary Vandercheck, but you can consult that guy who doesn't know what setup to buy. Yeah, like Matt, he's a <laughs> right. great, he's, Matt is really great at speaking and stuff, but maybe he didn't know the first thing about starting one or a guy right. like Matt or whatever. There's people right. out there that are really good conversationalists, but they're, they don't the, te- know. the technology right. side is not there or right. whatever. Or they like my friend Katya, she's really good with systems. And so like for her clients, like she knows that she can, she'll reach out to someone. All right, to work with me is 15 grand. Right. And just let that sit. Right, and if if they're killing it, their business is making money, but they need systems, they're gonna pay her. Exactly, and it's like people will pay you for your skill set. You you just gotta find those right people. The connections are a big part of it, but also yeah. like working and collaborating with the right people is is a perfect thing too. Like you said, with working with with your with your guy Andrew. I I even go back further than that. It's not about, and you have to be passionate about it. Very like, true. Like people these days, they buy honesty. They they buy passion. You know. Again, going back to lady with the blue with the blue chairs, she purchased my passion. She purchased me wanting to do the best I could do for her. She didn't care about all the other shit. She cared about I cared about what she wanted mm-hmm. and delivered on what she wanted. People you know? are hungry for that. Yeah, yeah. Can I have me? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like like social media has this part of me. Facebook has this part of me. Instagram has this part of me. Like, can I have me? Like, can you translate and give me me? Okay, I, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, and like some things I've I've done. Like, man, I'm not gonna say I'm 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 like super terrified when I finish a project, even for myself. Mm-hmm. Like, literally, Andrew has to talk me off the ledge. Like, dude, it, it, it's awesome. It's great. It, it's really cool, man. It's it's awesome. Like, it's good. It's he's like you're the best. And I'm like uh, I suck. This is awful. <laughs> This is awful. This is so god awful. It's funny that you say that because <laughs> on the way here, I was listening to some of my other podcasts, just like because I was thinking I- I'm trying to start this new branch of what I'm doing, like helping consult people with right. podcasts and getting their podcast set up. And I was listening. I'm like, okay, what podcast? What episode should I give as an example of like, okay, right. this is the type of product that I can help you create. Right. And I was listening to something. I'm like, ah, I hate that, or like, ah, I should have done that different, or like, ah, the audio is not perfect, or whatever. Right. And but but so many people on a consistent basis are like, dude, your podcast is fucking awesome. Yeah. And I'm like blown away by that because I'm just I'm just doing I'm just doing it the best I can. But but oh, I see man. I'm the hardest on myself. Exactly. I mean, I'm just like the lady. She I was like, she gave me money to build blue blue chairs. Like, oh my god. <laughs> like, like, like you could get anywhere to buy a blue chair. Well, not only that, but I was like, she's gonna curse me up and down. She's gonna like kill me. Cause all I delivered was blue chairs. I was like, oh my God, this is like, literally I went to Andrew's house before I delivered him. And we like, he's like, man, just smoke the bowl. Just like <laughs> get over it before you deliver the shit. It's like, just get over it because you know, I care. Mm-hmm. And, now, and now like talking to you, I get like, that's what people are buying. They're buying me. my They're buying that I care. And mm-hmm. I care that what they want. You know, that's what, that's what folks are buying. And like, you know, oh wow, that's another good insight. Like what I'm seeing now is that um, is like that that's the market. Like finding people that that want to be heard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, even in the furniture business, like you always think like you know in construction, 
yeah, you, you got to hear your general contract. You got to hear what they want because, you know, they have plans and they have timelines and they have this. And like individuals, they just want to be heard. You know, like the best customer service, like Chick-fil-A, you walk in there, like the customer service is amazing mm -hmm. because you feel like you're being heard. Mm -hmm. It's a fucking chicken sandwich. Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. But you feel like they heard you. Mm -hmm. You know, they heard that you want barbecue sauce. Yeah. They heard that you want large fries. They heard you want a half and half. Mm -hmm. You know, so and like, they appreciate you. And they the appreciate customer. that. Right. Right. So that's what that's like. That's a, an insight I'm getting talking to is like people. That's what I'm selling. People just want to be heard. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a book that my friend recommended. I haven't read it, but he kind of told me the premise of it. It's, I think it's called The Two-Second Lean. Oh, wow, well, I haven't heard that one. I need to write, read that. And, and what the idea is about is like taking, taking time to realize the shortcomings and save two seconds of your time. It came right. from the idea, I think it was Toyota in their production line. And typically an employee doesn't have very much like very much pull on right. like how to change the production line right there's right. someone that's already designed this but for i think it was toyota they had this concept that at any point every single employee on the line had a chance to stop production and suggest to the upper management a change they could make to save a couple seconds of time yeah like yo if we move this bin where i gotta grab this part a little bit closer then i'm saving like five seconds of walking every uh right. couple minutes and over the years, and that adds up. Exactly. And, and when they're pumping out that many cars, it could add to a whole other car that gets produced on a day right. or whatever. Exactly. And that, that increases their bottom line. Exactly. And it was crazy because it empowered every single employee to pause the production. Right. Like, like that doesn't happen. You know, right. like the employee had the power. And, and, I, and I thought about that. I was like, damn, if I was an employee and I knew that I had the power to stop production, I better have a, a damn good reason to stop the production because everyone's gonna be like, what the, why are we stopping again? Right. Like you better have a really good suggestion exactly. of how you can save a little bit of time. And, and that's amazing because a lot of people in their business, they're wasting a lot of time doing things yeah. the wrong way. It's like, okay, let's, let's pause and like regroup this and figure out how we can yeah. change, and, change and it's it all about, slightly. It's about listening to folks. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, again, like I said, this lady, what I did for her, she could buy anywhere, you know? But would she have been heard? Mm. Would she have felt like this is really mine, mm -hmm. you know, not just something I sit on every day, but this is really mine. Like someone took the time to listen to me and make this mine. Exactly. Exactly. You know? I, I, I know we kind of we've, we've talked about that subject a ton, but I think that's really like a core of it. And people need to hear this. But like, I think a lot of people out there right now are sitting on a dream that they have mm -hmm. and they're not executing on it. And you seem like somebody who. Like you said, you had this coffee company thing that you did. You know, you you had your electrical company that you you lost, and you kind of had that season of like, yeah. what the fuck do I do now? And then exactly. now you have your furniture business. Like, what kind of advice do you have for people that are kind of sitting on a dream that are are afraid to execute, or they they feel like ah, I don't know if people will care. I don't, right. you know, they're scared. Em embrace it. Embrace the fear. You know, embrace the failures. Like, I've learned so much, like, failing in furniture, and I still fail, but like, I embrace it, and I learn and I grow. Like, you know, my friends now, I, although they may not buy everything I do, but they remind me how much I've grown. Mm. They're like, dude, remember when you did this shit? Look what you're doing now. Yeah. You know, and like, I don't get excited about this stuff, you know, like... Uh, once it's once it's here in my I'm sorry I'm pointing to my head. Once yeah. it's once it's in my brain, like I'm over the excitement of it. Once yeah. I know it can be done, now that I have Andrew, now that I, I know how to get fabrics, now that I know, like once I have the idea, I'm no longer excited. Yeah. About it, and everybody's like, <gasps> but that's what your friends are for. Your friends are there to get excited for you to be like, oh my god, that's incredible. That's that's ingenious. That's like you don't need them to buy your shit. You need them to like remind you that you're you're doing it. Exactly. You're doing it. You're doing it. And I'm not doing it. You're doing yeah. it. You know, so. My, my friend Alex, he's a musician. Um, and he, uh, you might have seen his billboards or his um, commercial on TV where mm. he did a thing with American Family Insurance. Mm. And he's playing. He's, he's wearing a hat in the commercial. He's like playing. And then uh, Jennifer Hudson comes up yeah, and yeah, sings yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my friend Alex. I had him on my podcast, actually. I think it was episode 20. Right. And, um. One of the things he said in his podcast, he said, high school Alex would have high-fived the shit out of current Alex. Right. Because like high school Absolutely. Alex, like 
wanted to do music full time and he kind of gets caught up in like, ah, well, I'm making money, but I'm still kind of like struggling to right. to make this thing happen. And like a couple couple days ago, he opened for Kelly Clarkson, which right. is crazy, like at uh, the Roxy, at the like, Battery. Like, like you never know, like, you know, I lost um, that consulting gig. My contract was up like in September. Mm -hmm. And like at that point, I had a store last year. Store did great. But like I was so focused on the consulting gig that I didn't build the furniture. Like I stopped. Like there was like an eight month period of me doing furniture the past four years where I didn't create shit. And then I, I got into a couple of like relationships that I shouldn't have gotten into. Went through a bad breakup. Well, it wasn't bad. It, we shouldn't have broke up, but like I went through changes. You shouldn't have or you should have? I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have broken up with the girl at mm. all. Uh, at all. Matter of fact, her and I are, are like best friends. Like we talk all the time. Interesting. You know, and, um, and, but I see now that um, I have to align myself and put people in my, in my space that keep me creating because that's, that's my gift, mm -hmm. you know? And when I'm not creating, I'm not in the right place. So literally, like, I went from, you know, I did really, really well when I had the store open, but because I was consulting, I didn't pay any, any, any mind to put any energy into it. I was like, I got this gig. I don't need to do that anymore. I do when I feel like it. But literally, I left in September. October, I was like, what the fuck? You know, but like November, again, I started doing clients again. And literally, I, I billed like almost, almost gross five grand, you know, no plans. But what happened was I aligned myself with what I said I wanted for my life. And now, like... I've gone from no clients for three years, just doing shit when I felt like it, to like, I have three people waiting for me just to send them a bill. <laughs> you know, just to send them something, send, send them an email saying, I'm working on your shit. Like, like that, that's, where, that's where I've gone. Like, I've grossed so much money. Now, my, my profit wasn't huge because there's things I didn't know that I learned mm -hmm. very, very fast. Always learn fast from your mistakes. Fail fast. Yeah, fail fast. <laughs> That's really important. So now I know better and I'll make more money in the future. But like, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Like that's the alignment. And like, I always feel that when you're doing something you love, you'll always be tested. You know, like I mentioned earlier today, I don't think I, I said it on, on, on air, but like the company I consulted for, um, for the past year and a half, wants me to come back and do some work for them on another project that they have. And they want to throw a ton of money at me, you know, but you know, again, like I said, I was talking to the girl that I, I used to date for a long time. Like she's like, she's my best friend. That, that's that's my homie. Whatever, whatever. You know. And she was like, "But will you be happy?" She was like, y "You'll make money, but will you create?" You know, does it align with with what you want? Mm -hmm. Like, look at that part of it. You know, like, are you gonna make furniture? Are you gonna get distracted from? the Kevin Fuller, you know? And she's like, would the Kevin Fuller take that job if there's no furniture involved? <laughs> yeah. You know, my brand is my name because it's what I want to do and it's what I live and it's my passion. She's like, so how does that fit in, <laughs> in your alignment? Mm -hmm. she, I was like, but they're going to pay me like good gobs of money. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, but will you be happy? You know, I spent like last year, you talk about traveling, Went to Thailand for like twelve days. Ooh, last year. I need to go to Thailand. Yes, you do. Yeah, everybody, everyone listening to this needs to get a, a flight to Thailand right now. You know, that's it's so funny you say that because I I was doing some like kind of dream setting, goal setting the other day. I started mm. looking at some some like Airbnbs and right. stuff. Like I was like, I kind of want to just escape for like a month. And it's so funny, like that. I was looking at Thailand. Do you do vision boards at all? I, I, I like to do, because I, I like to do a lot of stuff on Photoshop. Right. I like to create yeah. some kind of uh, vision boards I put as my wallpaper or like my... Visuals are incredible. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you two quick stories. So I wanted a Porsche a Cayenne for like ever. It was always my dream car. And then I started doing vision boards and I literally put it on my vision board. And not only did I put it on my vision board, it was like the, um, the cover for my phone. It was the cover mm -hmm. on my computer. And I was like, there's no way in God's green can I afford... 
uh, a Porsche Cayenne. But how much is it? Le- did there's, you there's lease no, it? Did no, you buy it? No, I went and bought it. Wow. And this this is where it gets, it gets funny. And the base price Cayenne is what, like 70, 60? 70. And I didn't 70. pay that. Like, you know, this was like 2010 and I literally bought like a 2006. Yeah. Which was cool for me. You're but, on like a good point of the depreciation right, curve. Right, right. Yeah. So, so here's the funny thing. I was like, there's no way in hell I can afford a Porsche Cayenne. No way in hell. And like, it was like three o'clock in the morning and I was like, you know, I like, I keep my vision board. I'll show you. It's in my closet. So I see it every day. So, because I want another Porsche Cayenne, so it's back on my vision board. So, like, um, and it's not because I want it. I just want it on my terms now. Mm-hmm. I, I want to pay for it on my terms. Mm-hmm. So, like, it was, like, visualized everywhere on one of my old vision boards. And, like, this ad came up for a Porsche Cayenne 2006, and they wanted nineteen nine for it. And I was like, this shit's got to be fucked up. It, it, it's got to It's got to need a motor. Here, it gets even funnier. It had 52,000 miles on it. So I'm like, okay, 2006 Cayenne for 20 grand with 52,000 miles. Oh, it needs an engine. It needs tires. It needs brakes. It needs this. It needs it needs, it needs, it needs, it needs love. Right. It needs something. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to put this in the garage and rebuild the engine and drive it in 10 years. That, that's what I'm thinking. Uh-huh. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go look at it. And it was on the same lot I was going to buy another another car from. Another car. I was looking at an Audi you, A, A4 at the time. Okay. So I was like, fuck it. Another I'm, German car? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, is, that is kind of ironic, huh? Germans? Yeah. So, um, and I don't do it on purpose. I really don't. <laughs> really, really don't. They make good cars. And, there's, great and cars. there's a lot of German cars. Right. It's not like you're buying some Swedish car or something. Right, right, like right. There, there's, right. There's a lot of them. So I went down to the lot and I was like, man, just show me the Porsche just for shits and giggles. It's got to be fucked up. He's like, no, here's all the service records. Wow. And it was owned by a soccer mom. And she drove like, you know, 20 miles a day. Her husband just bought it for her. I was like, all right, so it needs new brakes? She's like, no, nope, brakes have been done. I was like, this guy needs new tires. Here's, here's a, she has brand Look new tires. Look at t- him. Right, she's got brand new tires <laughs> on the thing. I was like, it needs a transmission. She's like, no, no transmission work. I was like, well, it needs its 50,000 50, mile tune up, whatever. Nope, that's been done also. And I was like, wow. I was like, okay, this is fucked up. This is like something's wrong with this damn car. He's like, well, drive it. I was like, I drove the car. I was like, this is this is great. This is this is incredible. It's quick, you know. Not only that, but it had all the amenities that you would find in a newer car because the Germans are so far ahead. Exactly. Right. That's so, what people don't realize is if you buy man. like an, like my friend, he had an older Audi A4, and I was at the time driving like a Honda Accord, like an older one. Right. And his car had like all these newer things, but his car was like ten years old. Right. And they they, they think ahead. Totally. Like people, like luxury cars think ahead. So I was mm-hmm. like, all right, this guy doesn't long fit. Show me the service records. What was that car? Was it Carfax or Carfax? The mm-hmm. little Carfax thing? Looked yeah. it up. Perfect records. And I was like, why is it only 19.9? He was like, well, that's how much they go for now at this year. Yeah. And I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. So I bought it. So that was story one. Like, put the Porsche on the vision board, found the one that, that I could afford, bought it. No problem. So Thailand, like I, like my vision board, I put travel on my vision board. And for some reason, the travel magazine I was cutting out only had pictures of Thailand because I was at like a vision board party. Mm-hmm. So it's like, like all these pictures of Thailand. You're a vision board party. Yeah, yeah. That's like, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I like stuck all these pictures of Thailand, like subconsciously not knowing. For me, it just represented travel. Mm-hmm. It didn't represent Thailand. It represented travel. But you put Thailand but on I the put vision Thailand board. on the vision board. So I was like... Beaches and all that kind of stuff, or everything like Chiang, like Chiang Mai, the culture, um, Bangkok, Phuket, like all these different places in Thailand were on my vision board because that was the only magazine available to me at the time. I just need something that represented travel to me. And again, one of those three o'clock in the morning things, I see this flight to Thailand from New York for like five hundred eighty-four dollars round trip. Wow. I'm like, okay, there's wow. got to be there's got to be a fucking catch. Actually, it was cheaper than that. The, the flight at the end of the day, direct flight. Oh, yeah, from New York. No, there was a, there was a layover in Beijing. Okay. Fuck it, it's China. That's no cool. problem, right? So like, not only was it like five eighty four when I bought it, but something happened, and they had like a price decrease, and they sent me back a hundred bucks. Whoa! So I spent four hundred eighty four dollars from New York City to Thailand. Damn! And I spent one eighty from here to to New York to catch the flight. Like three o'clock in the morning, and I was like, "Why the fuck do I want to go to Thailand?" Oh yeah, it was my birthday, and I was like, "Like usually my birthday I take big trips." I'm like, "I'm gonna go back to Europe." Like you know, I can get around in France, I can get around in Germany, I can get around in Italy easy to be a good getaway. It'll be simple, you know. Then I was like, you know, I want to do something difficult. I want to do something that like how do your comfort zone a little like, bit? Like yeah, how like I've never I've never been to Asia. I was like, let's. But I wasn't thinking about that though, you know. But again, three o'clock in the morning, I see his flight for five eighty four to Thailand, and I was like. Thailand, five eighty four. 
So there's got to be a catch. So I'm like, I'm reading the fine print and the shit. Again, just like the Porsche. I'm like reading the fine print. Like, I don't believe the vision board. Like, I'm like reading the fine print. Like, what the fuck? I was like, buy it. So I bought, I bought the trip. And um, I went to Thailand for 12 days. Like, you know, and I didn't. Re- and the funny thing is, I didn't realize it, it was on my vision board until I was packing. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, was, I was packing to go to Thailand. And, I, and like I said, my vision board was, was, was in my closet. Actually, it was on my nightstand at that time. It was on my nightstand, and I was like, all these pictures of Thailand, and here I am going to Thailand. You know, and then also on my vision board, and I'll show you, it had opened my own store. I had opened my own store. I didn't even... Think about that. Didn't even think about it. You know, but I found booth space in a furniture place, and I, I bought a booth and opened my own retail location. Like, like, so I tell everybody, vision board, man, visualize it. Look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, and actually look at like the price because I think, I think I, I was talking with my friend about this. It's not I, even the price because mm-hmm. if you want it, and it's on your vision board, it will manifest. It will manifest. Yeah, and it will come for what you can afford and what you can do. And people, <laughs> people always think like, oh, I want to be a millionaire. It's like, why? No, dude, like break down the price points. Right. Like, like if you were make like for me the other day, I I broke down like, okay, what would be good, better, best? Right. My best, like, I, I was like, dude, if I was making a hundred grand, like, I would right. be, I would be so, I, I would feel like king of the world. Right. I would be traveling tons of places. And like you said, it's like, you, you think that, oh, a Porsche Cayenne is going to cost me 70K. Right. That's my, that's my, that's more than my yearly income right. or whatever. But right. then you found one for 19. Right. I didn't, I'm not going to say I found it. The universe, I aligned with, I said I wanted it. The universe said, here it is. Mm. You know? Like, it's powerful stuff. Like even even in building our company, like my business partner and I, he went to Auburn for two years. I went to Norfolk State for two years. We built houses. We started an electrical company. We had no fucking idea. We just said, we want a company where we can work together, you know, and hang out all day every day. That's all we wanted, you know. And we created like from two thousand from actually two thousand one two thousand thirteen. I work with my best friend every day. Only because that's how I said I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. We didn't put stipulations on what it looked like or the type of company. We just said we want to work together every day. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all we said, and we aligned with that. And the universe gave us what, what we gave us what we, gave us what we wanted. Because you, I mean, someone else would be like, "How do you connect the dots from like a coffee thing to an electrical thing to a furniture thing?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like it's like Should Tarzan. My dad. It's like Tarzan <laughs> swinging on vines. <laughs> right. You don't know which vine you're right. going to grab next. You just you just see an opportunity, and I think that's right. one of the biggest things is like seeing the opportunity for what it is right. and taking that jump. Because and people, trying it, yeah, trying it. Like like even my dad was like, "Okay, you did coffee. You're really going to fucking build a house? Really? You're going to build a house? <laughs> Come on, beans, but, beams, right? <laughs> like, right. What? right. No my way. dad's like, whatever. But to be honest <laughs> with you, like you know, one of the investment properties we built, my parents bought and still own. Wow. You know, really? and now my parents like own like four or five pieces of investment property. But they weren't thinking about that until I took the jump to build houses and their minds started triggering. So my dad's like, he was like my worst. Well, I'm not gonna say he was my worst critic. He always supported me. He was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, but now he gets me. He's like, you're an entrepreneur. So he's like, all right, what's next? I was like, I'm gonna do furniture. Okay, what's after furniture? I'm like, I don't know. I'm doing furniture right now. Mm -hmm. He's like, I wanna invest in something. You know, so it comes full circle. So now I'm going, so now my sister is is gotten older, you know. She's gotten so she's gotten kind of liquid. She's like, let's build houses. Let's let's build rental income properties, you know. Because my parents have been triggered, you know. We're seeing my folks own own properties and get income off properties and tax breaks off properties. So my sister's like, let's build properties. I'm like, I got all this experience that I didn't make tons of money with, but now I know how to make money with it. And now she's coming. And like, and you're gonna find out with your podcast. It's like. It's not seeking the clients. What's going to happen is you're going to get to a point where you're going to accept clients. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's not. It's not finding them. You're going to start accepting clients. Like you're going to get aligned to accept them. Mm-hmm. Like even, and that's kind of like yeah. what Tim Ferriss talks about with right. like the 20 rule. It's right. like you're going to have eighty percent of your clients that give you troubles, and right. the twenty percent are, are creating most of the income anyways. Right. And they give you no troubles. Right. And and Tim Ferriss is absolutely that was a, an amazing book for our work week. Yeah. So when we bought Able Electric in, in 2008, going going back to electronic environments, we bought Able Electric in 2008. And again, we started cutting off clients. And I read Tim Ferriss' book about the 80-20 rule. And I was like, I told my business partner, I was like, 
we're going to fire like seven of our clients. He's like, we're going to be broke. I'm like, nah, we're not. You know, and luckily, like I said, we were best friends. So he read, he was like, let me read this fucking book. What the fuck are you reading? Yeah. So he checked it out. And like, you know, he always trusted my judgment. I was like, we're going to fire everybody. We're going to fire all the headaches. I'm firing them now. You know, and we're going to, and literally, like, I fired everybody. And then at that point, we took, we got the uh, rental car facility contract at the airport where they're building a rental car facility. You know, like I, we said, this is what we want. Like once we figured out we had a business and the university gave us that, we started saying, I started saying, what do we want next? We were like, well, we want to be a contractor that does X, Y, Z. And like, we were so stupid. His dad used to call <laughs> us like, his dad used to call us like two dummies incorporated. <laughs> he was like, you guys are too stupid to know that you're doing dumb shit. <laughs> he was like, you're, you're just two dummies. <laughs> You know, and like two dummies incorporated. It was funny, like, our, and, and honestly, our payroll checks had short buses on them on the on the payroll checks on purpose. And I was like, "Why do you have these buses on the payroll checks?" And we we're like, "Because us, it's like short buses, and people keep calling us stupid." So we're like, uh, "Embrace it, right? Embrace it." We're, <laughs> you know, but we took chances. You know, that's amazing. We we took chances. That's funny, man. You know, but see, the funny thing is, is like this is this is one person that comes to mind for me, my buddy Matthew. And, and right now he's a student at Harvard, which is right. so, so funny. But when we were growing up, he was always so, uh, he, he was like so outgoing and crazy. He came off as like really dumb sometimes. Right. Like he'd walk up to, like, for example, we were on spring break. He'd just walk up to a group of girls and say some dumb shit. But then all of a sudden we were talking to some hot girls. Take his chance. It, and we were like, Matthew, what the, f- what the fuck are you doing? And then all of a sudden we're talking to some hot girls and we're like, wait a second. Matthew's onto something. Like yeah. he's not afraid to put himself out there. Meanwhile, I'm like overthinking the crap. What do I? <laughs> right. What do I say to right. them? What do I? Right. He's just going out there breaking right. the ice, right. and then it just happens. Right, it just happens. Exactly. Just, and just... so, like people, people would say, oh, "Dude, I don't know the first thing about X, Y, and Z." But you start accumulate once you start and fail and try. You accumulate a weird skill set that eventually r- will propel you it's into the next. All thing. a muscle. It, it it might not be physical, but it's it's all a muscle. Creativity is a muscle entrepreneurship is a muscle the more you use it the more you try it the more you fail fast and and learn and be willing to learn and not like you know because even even for me a long time i'd fail and like man, i'd go through this like depressive state like oh my god but like again as i get older like i'm seeing like all the skills that i accomplished and failed at people are willing to pay me for now mm-hmm. <laughs> you know which is crazy to think which, about which is, which is wild i'm like i failed like but 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 you know how to do it now. You know how to do it better. You know, like you said earlier, you lost thirty grand, but now it was like a thirty thousand dollar learning experience. Learned a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I go into everything with a lawyer. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. one of my best friends is, is a lawyer. Like, I always read the fine print. I always read the contracts. You know, and even when we lost money on that school, like, I learned a hell of a lot. You know, mm-hmm. like when it comes to business, it's very cutthroat and very impersonal. You know. And I'm sure you've negotiated or tried to negotiate something like everything on earth. It's, you know, the way capitalism is set up is like, how can I fuck you so I can win and and make more, either save more money or make more money. You know, there's some win-win situations, Mm -hmm. you know, not too much of construction, (laughs) but there's some win-win, there's some win-win situations. But the thing is, it's like, um, that's, 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 that's our mindset. How Mm -hmm. can I beat you? One of my mentors, he talked to me about the situation where earlier, uh, so I have a, right now I'm working at a job right? and we were, I was negotiating with a client and I didn't budge and he eventually said, well, we're going to choose something else. And I said, okay. Okay. They did you a favor. 20 minutes later, he calls me back and says, we're going to do it. And it was funny because my, my mentor, he said, everyone's playing this game of liar, liar. Mm -hmm. They're lying about what they're willing to spend Mm -hmm. and you're lying about what the profit margins you're willing to sacrifice. Right. Yep. And it's funny because, like, because for you, you could you could make the chair for a grand or whatever and still profit, but you're Easy. selling it for twenty five hundred right. because you know right. that the clientele is there and people are right. willing. And once you kind of like once you get that first client that pays right. that, you're like, I'm not going to accept any less than this. Right. And so that's how I was with this client. I was like, I know this guy's trying to weasel me down, but we've already gotten to that price point right. that we know people will pay. Right. I'm going to get someone to pay it, right. and I'm not going to budge. Well, my thing is charge more. Mm-hmm. Like fuck the people that are willing to pay what you're worth. Find the people that are willing to pay more because they're out there, right? And they have skin in the game. And like I said, like this lady, she bought, a, she got bought what I gave her anywhere. But 
you know, she was like, okay, you're the man. You you're gonna give me care. You you listen to me. You're That's gonna dope. give me what I want. What I want. And those are the clients you want. You know, I'm in all kinds of groups. Like my client sucks, and my clients didn't pay me. And my clients didn't do this. And I was like, well, did you qualify? So like, I tell people now, like even. People will call me to do something for them. And I say, okay, well, great. There's an interview process. I have to see if I like you. And they're like, but I'm paying you. I'm like, yeah, but if I don't like you, I'm not going to give you the worth. I'm not going to give you what you want. It's going to be headaches and it's not worth it for me. None of the money in the world is worth it. Right, right. So I'm like, they're like, what do you mean you have to like interview me? Like, I'm paying you money. I'm like, yeah, but I might not like you. We might not vibe right. Like, you know, it was funny. I, I just sold these, these chairs. I had the chairs for two years. And they'd been in photo shoots and like weddings and things like that. And I was ready to sell them. And I wanted a certain price for the chairs. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot because I was like, fuck, I made my money off of them already. I just want to get rid of them. For me, like when I have pieces I've done, I get to a point, I just want the creative mental space. So I'll get rid of them and sell them. So uh, I, I do pop-ups every month at Scott's Antique. Um, and so this lady came and she was like, oh, I want these chairs. And she was like, how much? And I was like, yeah, the 600 bucks for the pair. And she went to balk and da, 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 da. And I was like, I, I don't want you to have these. And like, she look, looked at me like I was a fucking idiot. She was like, she's like, but we're at 500 bucks in the negotiation. I'm like, yeah, I don't feel right with these being in your house. I, I don't feel it. I, I, I'm just not. And then like this other, this, another client, another person came up there. Like, I really, like they were Googling and like, like ugly over these chairs. And she was like, how much for these chairs? And I was like, and I told the price 600 bucks. She was like, oh wow, I just can't afford those, but these are awesome. But she, like she pitched me like, this is what I'm gonna do with them. I'm gonna put them in this room and then I'm gonna do this with them. And like, they would look perfect. And I was like, tell you what, how much can you afford? She was like $200. And I was like, you know what? You give me 200 bucks, you can have them. You know, I literally broke even on these things, but I was so happy they went to a, a good home that it, it made up for the 400 bucks. Now, you know, my car company, they, they probably, in my mortgage, they probably want the $400, but like it made up. And then literally, like the lady calls me, she's like, these, thank you so much. These are the perfect things for my house. This is absolutely what I wanted. Can you come do all the furniture in my house? Redo all the furniture in my house. And I was like, well, you, it's not 200 bucks to do all the, redo all the furniture. You know, and she's like, okay, well, how much is it? I was like, uh, uh, okay. So I went to the client's house and like she's taking me around the whole house. She's like, I want you to do these chairs. I want you to do the sofa. I need pillows for this. We got to do a chair for my bedroom. We got to do this. And I'm like, lady, you only paid me 200 bucks. Can you afford it? Like in my head, I'm like, can you afford this shit? So for shits and giggles, like I sent her a quote for, for, for a pair of chairs, how much custom chairs were. And she's like, oh, I love the price. Can we change the fabric? And I'm like, what? It's like, you only gave me 200 bucks for those, but you're willing to give me, you know, 800 bucks to do this. But it was all the fact that like, we had a connection. Like, like, like I heard her, mm -hmm. you know, like I heard the lady, you know, and, and she can't like, she doesn't have the money to like give me all, give it all up front. So she's like, can we do like a share at a time over time? Can you do these first for me? You know, I can afford, I can, like my budget this month is $1,000. Can we do these two chairs right now? Okay, cool. You know, she's like, February, my budget will be this. Can we do another chair? Okay, cool. You know, when I get my taxes back, I can afford this, this, and this. Can we do that? Okay, cool. You know, like, so like this lady's gonna have a totally customized house in less than a year, you know, for what she would have paid at rooms to go or whatever, you know, and it's all, it's all her stamp. You know, and I found like my best clients are like other other artists. So this lady owns a dance studio. That's cool. You know, so like she's they get it. They're like, I just want it. Like you said, I, she appreciates that I hear her, and she appreciates that I'm bu I'm building something for her that's custom for her. You know, so she wants me to touch the rest of her house, and she knows it's going to be individualized for her. You know, so that's that's the, that's the really cool thing. That's yeah. awesome, dude. Yeah, that's really cool. I feel like. We've done a badass podcast. We almost about hit two hours. Oh shit! Have we really? Yeah, man. Doesn't oh my it feel, god, dude! Like this is. I was about to say, like, I feel like me and you vibe so well. <laughs> right. It doesn't feel like right. anything is forced. Like that's crazy. I have to say, some some podcasts, you know, like I meet somebody and 
we can talk for an hour. Right. But then after an hour, it's kind of like, okay, we've talked about what we right. want to talk about. Let's right. wrap it up. Right. And then sometimes it's like, especially like with, we, we got the cigars. <laughs> right. We're chilling. Right. We're, we're having right. a good time. We're, right. we're able to connect right. on a lot of different subjects. Like, right. I, could, I almost feel like we could just talk for, for forever. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and that's the kind of conversations. That, that's what this podcast is about. Like, exactly. that's what I love, exactly. man. Exactly. And, like, going back to friends, like, when you, like, like um, I'm doing Matt's podcast this week sometime. That's awesome. Never done any interviews. Again, I just started putting my face on social media, you know, but my friends are like, you know, when I, when I told them, I told a, a couple people, like, this guy wants to interview, interview me for a podcast. I was like, I think I'm gonna cancel. I was like, I, I was like, what the fuck am I gonna say on a podcast? <laughs> but they, but my friends again, they might not support me financially, but they were the ones like, dude, you do it, do it, just mm-hmm. just just, it's gonna be a great experience. Like you know, mm-hmm. your next step is magazine covers. Like do it, like do it, have fun with it. And I'm like, oh okay, so you know that's, that's the reason why we're here today. You know, I that's do want, awesome. I do want to answer your question <laughs> of like why did I like how did I get into art? Yeah. Um, I was dating again. I was dating some chick at the time, and she was big into art, you know. And again, like I had come out of this this business world, and I wasn't. I was. I'm not a social animal, you know. My friends will tell you I like to be invited to parties. Doesn't mean I'm going to show up. Mm-hmm. But I like being invited. Of course, it doesn't mean I'm going to show up. Yeah. So you know, she really kind of got me out of my shell and got me to different places. And then one day she was like, "Let's go to a museum." And I went to the High Museum for the first time. You know, I had, I had, not for the first time, I had been, I even been a member, but I was a member because I wanted to make business connections and go to member events to meet, to meet clients. Like I didn't go to appreciate the art. So I went with like different eyes and I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. This is incredible. So her and I started going to different museums. So she would call me and she's like, hey, let's go to Selma, Alabama. There's like a history museum on buses in Selma. I was like, what? You know, and I was like, yes. Like, I stopped saying no, you know, because, like, again, I was going through this, like, like this deep depression. Like, I was like, so I just decided, stop saying no. Like, just just try it. So I went to this, this museum in Selma, Alabama. It was great. And I was like, you know, again, new eyes. It, it was awesome. So then we went to this, we went to this museum in, um, where were we? In Macon, Georgia, you know. And then we went to a cherry blossom festival. You know, like shit that I've never done before. You know, I started, it was an art festival in Macon. It was a cherry blossom festival, but it had like different artists playing stuff. And like, I started appreciating, seeing things with different, with different eyes and what's, what's really connects with me. You know, so then we went from, um, we did that. And then we actually drove to New York City to see a Kara Walker event. If you don't know who Kara Walker is, look her up. Fuck it, incredible. So Kara Walker, just side note for people that are listening, Kara Walker did this big exhibit at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn where she made this gigantic sphinx, you know, to pay homage to the people who died in, in the sugar trade. Incredible. Fucking incredible. So after that, I went to the Studio Museum of Harlem, you know, like every state. And then we like drove back and we stopped in Virginia because um, I'd done all the museums in D.C. and Baltimore because, like, you know, I have family there, so I knew that shit. So we stopped at this museum, the, the Virginia State Museum. I'm like, I love that, you know. And then I went to the museum in, 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 um, in Tennessee and in Nashville and Chattanooga. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I get it. And then, like, just joking, just joking. I was like, I want to be an artist for the rest of my life. And my friends laughed and laughed. Like, dude, you can't even fucking draw. I'm like, yeah, but I want to be an artist. Like, I don't know how, you know, but again, it's just, it's just all like mental manifestation, you know? And like, I don't understand that, but like for people that understand, like you create your world, you really don't get it until things like this. Like, I don't, I don't, I didn't get it until like you called me and we're talking now. And like, I get it now. Like I manifest where I am now, Mm -hmm. you know, I manifest all this stuff. So I was like, I'm not an artist. So I was moving to Charlotte. And I bought a chair. And I only bought the chair because one, I was broke and it was 20 bucks. And I love the shape of the chair. And I, again, I'll show, I'll show it to you um, in the house. Like, I love the shape of the chair. And then she was like, you know, you can just upholster it if you don't like it or throw a cover over it. And I was like, wait, I can upholster it? You know, and that's when I got into talking to different upholsterers. And this was the first time I, I bumped, into, bumped into Andrew. 
because there was, there was a gap where we didn't work together because I lived in North Carolina and I, I thought I was going to post her myself. But so like, I was like, word? And I was like, I can pick my own fabric? You know, so I picked my own fabric. I said, you know, in my mind, for me, this is what I want my chair to look like. I wanted to have a geometric pattern. I wanted to be gray and white so I can put it anywhere. And, you know, I want to do something funky like pinstriping. I want some shit that people walk in and have never seen ever in any home ever. That's what I wanted. So I found, I found fabric and it cost me a fucking arm and a leg because I didn't know how to buy fabric at that time. You know, and then again, I, this is when I found Andrew on Craigslist and we connected and bonded. And he built the chair for me and I was like, this is fucking awesome. This is incredible. Again, I wasn't planning on being in the furniture business, but... It was just something you wanted. I just wanted art. So, like, I went to dinner with some buddies of mine. Um, again, this was after they had laughed at me about being an artist. And, like, you know, we were drinking and, you know, I showed them the chair and they were like... And my buddy Damon was like, he was like, you know, this is art. I was like, get the fuck out of here. He's like, dude, this is, this is an art. Like, you're transforming something old and making it new again and with new patterns with, with, with people. That, so it was something that no one's ever seen. This is art. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. He's like, no, this is art. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm an artist. And then the girl I was seeing at the same time, she's like, yeah, this is, this is art. This is a fucking art. You know, and then my mentor, she's a designer in furniture. She'd been my mentor. I had no clue that she was in the furniture business. Like, I knew, but I, like, I didn't pay attention because she was consulting me, like, on business taxes and things like that but like didn't didn't register that she was a designer and she was like yeah it's an art and i was like get the fuck out of here so i was like you know i said i wanted to be an artist the rest of my life i bumped into doing furniture i was like i'm gonna start a furniture business so the second chair i did i built and like i think i put it on, on instagram you know and this is i had maybe like five followers you know one person i didn't know <laughs> You know, and that one person I didn't know passed it to somebody else. And the person like DM me and said, how much for that chair? And I said, and my response was, I don't know. I, I did it for me. So the lady's like, you know, I'll give you 800 bucks for the chair. And I was like, what chair? <laughs> like, like totally not catching on. Like she wants my art. And I was like, what chair? She's like, so she resent me the picture that I had posted on Instagram, like this chair. And I was like, for what? $800? I was like, you'll pay for that? She was like, yeah. Can you, do, how much is delivery? I was like, what, how much is delivery? I was like, 800 bucks. I'll drive it from Charlotte to Atlanta right now. <laughs> right, in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, at that point I was like, I'm an artist and my medium is furniture, you know? And then I got with an artist buddy of mine. And again, like I said, like, I love Showing people there's, there's different ways, but when you don't know that you don't know, until you learn, you don't know what you're teaching people. Mm -hmm. So I went to him and I was like, why don't you design fabric, to like create a piece of art, I'll put it on fabric, I'll do the furniture. Man, him and I went back and forth for four years, like never gave me shit. Like he's a true artist. Like I love Kevin to death. His name is Kevin also. I love Kevin to death, but he's a true artist. So he was like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what, what I want to put on fabric. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I was like... Fuck it. I'm going to keep creating furniture, you know, because I love it. I'll find fabric. I'll figure it out. So I, so I kept creating furniture and I kept doing pieces and people kept loving them. And then like, I, like literally the third piece I did was those two chairs. I told you, I sold to a furniture guy for 800 bucks who sold them for $2,700. Like then I was like, this is a business. Like this is, I'm happy. It's art. It's like our electronic, our, our electrical company. It was two friends. One just wanted to work together, you know, business formed around that. I want to do art. I said to the universe, I want to do, I want to be an artist, business formed around that, you know? So like, it, it, and that's, that's, that's how, that's how, that's how I got into the furniture business. And I was like, wait, I can do this over and over and over again. And like, like, I was calculating, like, I spent 300 bucks. She paid me 800 bucks. It's like, I, I can do this shit again, mm -hmm. you know? And I always wanted to start a, a, another business because I've always been in business. But my thing with business is like, you're selling the same service over and over and over and over again. And the thing I admired about artists is they're always selling different art pieces. And their style evolves. Right, and their style evolves. Exactly, exactly. So I was like, furniture is for me because I can have a furniture business which satisfies my business needs, but I can create something different, you know, under the umbrella of a furniture business. So that's how I got into furniture. Like, I, like I wanted something that I could do something different every day. 
and I wanted to be in business for myself, and I wanted to be an artist, furniture was born. That's that dope. Way. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. dude. Yeah. So for, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like this has been a super <laughs> awesome podcast. Like seriously, this has been a really great podcast because oh, very cool. It, you know, I I love that you kind of have this. I think a lot of people focus too much on like okay crafting their thing and i feel like you're just being yourself and that's yeah. what you've been talking about this whole time so like if people want you know if people want to buy your art of course hit you up on instagram all that kind of stuff it seems like you kind of just Dude, one, one to one basis that's and that's the, where a lot of that's the funny thing like i literally have no no <laughs> website like everything i do is on instagram mm -hmm. and i'll post it and like i have a facebook account I forget to post it to Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, like everything has been like, I have a couple of friends that like, I've had literally one friend that's bought something from me. The rest have been Instagram posts and people asking me, can I build them something off Instagram? And I'm like, I have no website. And I, I do have a manager. I, I grow, I work with Heather. She's an interior designer. You know, I trust her a lot. And she's the one that's like, like get your voice out there, you know, get interviews. Like I've turned down like photo shoots. I've turned down all kinds of high end shit. I'm just like, I don't want, I don't want to be out there. Mm -hmm. She's like, but, but now talking to you, I get that I do have a, a story. I do have something to tell. I do have a, a unique vision of what I'm doing, um, and I, I appreciate that that you that you called and asked me because this is the type of shit, this is the type of shit entrepreneurs need, mm -hmm. you know. And literally everybody should be doing a podcast. Everybody's got something to say, mm -hmm. you know. And because like money and it's, it's just energy exchange, everyone can have the same business, but no one can be, no one can be Andrew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one can be Kevin, you know, no one can be the next guy, you know, like people purchase me. They purchase the experience of Kevin Fuller, you know, they, they purchase that I listen and I, I care about the concerns and I put my passion into what they're purchasing. That's what people. That's what people purchase. Mm -hmm. You know. So again, dude, you're on the right path, man. Just thank you. Just, just, you know, step out there. Mm -hmm. You're ten miles ahead of fifty percent of the world mm -hmm. because you stepped out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's talking about furniture. Why am I doing furniture? I said I was going to. <laughs> You and know? you enjoy it, right? And I enjoy it. It is a passion of mine. That's you know, the most important. I thing. created a business card that said. The Kevin Fuller. Again, my friends laughed. Like, you know, I was like, I'm closing Design Studio 72. I don't like the name. Everyone was like, that's stupid. It's awesome. I'm like, I don't like it. I was like, I want to be me. I just want to be, the rest of my life, I want to be an artist. I want to be Kevin Fuller. I want to be the Kevin Fuller. You know, and I said the because, like, I am the one and only me. You know, it's not an arrogance thing. You know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm 45, mm -hmm. like, literally. You know, like, what am I going to do the rest of my life? This is it. I want to be me. I just want to be me. And if I can get paid for being me and I can, I can offer you something for being me and you buy it, great. If not, cool. But at the end of the day, man, yo, I sleep so good. <laughs> you know, yep, yep. I still might get only four or five hours a night because so, my creative brain wakes me up yeah, or I'm creating yeah. in my sleep. Like I don't get hard REM sleep because literally I create in my sleep or in, in my rest modes. But like, you know, I never wake up like, you know, even today, like just being real. Like I was trying to figure out how to pay my my um, my heat bill. I got it paid, you know, but it, I'm, my money's tight. But like I have a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. I got a German car. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm happy. Like I'm, I'm ha I've had my first interview that, you know. What what else does life have to offer? Mm -hmm. You know, like yes, I miss the money, but like I'm kind of happy. Mm -hmm. And know? there's people out there that are that are working like a stable job. They've got the money, they got all the stuff, but they're not feeling feeling fulfilled. Miserable. Mm -hmm. Just like soul sucking. Miserable. You know? Yeah. And like yeah. like man, there's so much freedom in being in being broke. I mean, you look at a homeless guy. What are his responsibilities? Make sure I eat today. Make sure no one kills me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And again, it's a muscle. Once he's mastered how to eat and be alive, what other stress is there? <laughs> yep. It's like I've heard this. It's like a parable or kind of thing where the uh, there's a fisherman in a small town. He's a fishing village. He 
yeah. he, he fishes every day and yeah. then at the end of the night he comes and plays guitar and yeah. hangs out with his friends yeah and a businessman comes and says yeah. you know oh you know you could really monetize blah 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 and he said right. okay then what and then you can open up this and blah 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 and then what right. and then you can and then you can retire and then you can fish all day and play <laughs> right. guitar with your friends right and he's like and he's like i already I do, do that, that now i already do that every day right and uh, right. It's, right. it's it's right. it's so true man like right you got to but it takes so long to get out of the system. Like, I wanted to be everybody else. You know, my second marriage, I dated a girl. <clears throat> well, one, being in business, you're always invited to a lot of events. So you want to have the hottest chick so that you can meet the right people, so you can have the right connection. So I, I literally got married for the wrong reasons. I dated her because she was fine as fuck. Just point blank. You know, but I had, I had no... I didn't invest into caring about who she was as a person. I just cared about it. she was fine as fuck. She looked good on my arms when I went to networking events. It could make me money. That's not life. That's not life at all. You know, I admire those guys that married their college sweetheart, you know, before they get into the system, you know, mm -hmm. and build something. You know, that that that's life. You know, and it, it was confusing to me. Like, you know, like I, like we're doing electronic environments, you know, I touched millions, millions of dollars, like through my bank accounts, millions of dollars. But for some reason, I was only happy on Fridays when I picked up my niece from school and we went to McDonald's and talked about her day. That was the only time that I felt joy in my life. Hmm. It was, was like Friday, picking my niece up from school, going to McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, you know, eating nuggets and talking about her day. You know, like she didn't care about nothing else. You know, Uncle Kevin, can we, can we do this? Okay. You know, to her, that's the world. Mm -hmm. Costing what, 12 bucks at Chick fil A? Yeah. You Nothing. know, five bucks in gas to go get her. You know, a couple hours of my time. But like, that was the happiest thing on earth. You know, so making the transition from like businessman to deciding I want to be an artist to creating furniture. How can I be the Kevin Fuller every day? How can I do it? You know, even even like I said, the the girl that that's like my like my super best friend. She's like, you're happy now. She's like, you're not working, but you're happy. Mm -hmm. She's like, you do your furniture and you're 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 fucking ecstatic. She's like, I hate being around you when you have a job. <laughs> She's like, I'd rather you know give you bread and peanut butter and jelly than you work because you're fucking miserable. And the bad thing is, a lot of us don't even know we're miserable. Mm. <laughs> We think it's normal because we look to the left, the guy in the cubicle is doing the same shit. You know, miserable has become the new norm. <laughs> you know, over the years, miserable has become the norm. You know, and then when you find good people that say, uh, no, you're happy. You're happy when I see you do this. You know, you're happy when I see you do that. And again, back to the friends thing. Like, that's what your friends are for. They might be there to give you money and pay your bills and keep you supported in, in your art or whatever you decide to pursue. But they are there to give you the barometer of you're happy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're happy. You know, my friends see me way more. Again, I'm super introverted. Nobody comes to my house. You know, I don't think my, I don't think my best friends come to my house. Yeah, Archie's never been to my, like, him and I talk every fucking, almost every other day. Never been to my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but him and I, he's also in the construction business. And when I talk to him, he's like, dude, because uh, I'll call him and say, hey, man, such and such offered me a job. He's like, nope, you won't be happy. Mm -hmm. he, and he's always like, dude, just pursue what you're happy. It's like, why do you care about the shit? Just keep being happy. You know, keep keep being happy. You know, so that's, that's why I'm the Kevin Fuller. Like, everything nowadays is on my terms. You know, my parents are at a point in their lives, they're retiring, but they get it. Mm -hmm. You know? they get it my dad comes to me all the time he's like man i should have invested in your coffee business it's like i missed that boat you know my dad again he's like what are you doing next my mom's a huge supporter mm -hmm. like fuck that's that. amazing are you happy you know are you happy and even like even and even in my, in my dating life like you know i date you know um i probably won't be dating much longer because there's, there's somebody like i like mm -hmm. you know i plan on I, uh, yeah i can say it I, I plan on being with her the rest of my life but, um, you know, it's all about being happy. That's awesome. You know? And, like, I don't, you know, it's, it's my friends tell me, even though I'm not doing that, I'm happy for you doing that, you know. 
and then even in, even in, in dating this girl, it's not. I can go to her and say, "I'm dating this chick over here. Are you happy? You don't have to be with me, but are you happy?" Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. and that's what friends are for. Mm-hmm. Like, are you happy? Like testing that barometer of, like, you know. Are you breaking the miserable? Because everyone wants to cheer you on if you're breaking the norm of being miserable. Mm-hmm. Because they they don't have the, they are f- afraid of breaking the norm of being miserable. And ninety nine percent of the world is stuck in that man. They're stuck in that. They're stuck in being miserable. Mm-hmm. You know. So it's true. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't want to hold you up, but like you know, dude, you're good, man. I'm I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff. Exactly. I'm passionate about people being free. Exactly. You know, like you know, get get over this get over the stuff. The stuff is awesome. You know, you you want a nice car? Go test drive it. You know, go rent it. <laughs> you know, but are you happy? Exactly. Exactly. You know? So my, my brand is, is, again, listening to people, hearing what they want, delivering to them what they want. Not even delivering to them what they want, delivering them the promise that I'll hear them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I will put my passion into your project. Mm. You know, and just. That's all you can ask for. Right. Right. Like, my clients don't suck. Mm-hmm. You know, when people come to me, they're like, Kevin, I have X, Y, Z. Uh, I did these blue, these blue wingbacks, blue and white wingbacks. And like, you know, me and the lady talked a couple of times. And then finally, it was her that convinced me. She was like, I just want something that has some blue in it. I don't care what you do. I just want you to make it. <laughs> you know, so I made this great blue and white wingbacks for her. That she's <clears throat> ecstatic. Um, they're, they're on my Instagram page as well. And then I'll, I can show you pictures later. But yeah. like. She's ecstatic because I listened to her. And she has a piece, not only me, but she has a project in her house that someone put passion into that I listened to her that she loves. Mm-hmm. She didn't care. She didn't, she didn't, at the end of the day, what makes me different in this business is, again, I listen to folks. You know, I deliver what they want. I deliver who they are. But that's it. You know, just, just they, want, they want me. They, they want a piece. They want, not, I'm sorry, not to say that in an arrogant way. They want, mm-hmm. they want my passion. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. They, and that's, that's what passion. people are hungry for. That's what they want. Right, right. That's badass. Right. Yeah. So if people listening to this want to buy your furniture, is Instagram the best way to reach Still out? Still Instagram. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Heather, don't, don't shoot me. Trust me, the website's <laughs> coming. You well, know. I'll be sure to link everything, all your information in the show notes yeah, and all that fine. if people want to reach out. But any other, any other last closing uh remarks or anything that you can add i feel like we've i feel like we touched on a ton of awesome stuff man yeah um closing your friends won't give you money but they'll give you everything you need yeah is is what i'll say i like that and two like um be you you know everyone's trying to compete for you know market share you know you have wendy's mcdonald's and burger king you know, they're all competing for the same market share for a fucking hamburger. You know, but no one, no one can ever be you. Mm-hmm. It took me a long time. Like again, again, like I said earlier, like when I had electronic environments, I was Kevin Fuller of electronic environments, and half the time I was just the president of electronic environments. People didn't even know my name. Mm-hmm. They just knew what I could do for them. Mm-hmm. No one knew who the fuck I was. But like, that's why I'm the Kevin Fuller now. There we like, go. You're gonna buy me. Um, that's it. Just be yourself. There we go. Love yourself. That's awesome it. stuff. We'll have to pee so bad. <laughs> so I got several restrooms still. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, there we no go, doubt. dude. Well, no Kevin, doubt. thanks for being on the show, appreciate dude. It, man. I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. And yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like an episode two might have to be <laughs> an episode two might have to be in the future because, like I said, I, I can't ask for much more in a conversation. You know, when I feel like it's just natural, yeah. it's flowing. Yeah. That's all you can ask for. So, and again, I'm just me. Mm-hmm. There's nothing else. There's no secret to it. Mm-hmm. There's no special sauce. Everyone can do what I'm doing, but they can't be me. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, cool deal. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, appreciate and, uh, it. We'll see you next time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. There we go, folks. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. There was a lot of, a lot of really good little golden nuggets in there. A uh, lot to learn from Kevin. I, I, I'm gonna, I haven't gone back and listened to the whole thing. It was a long one, 
Um, but uh, I, I went and re-listened to a lot of sections of it, and it was some great stuff. Um, I really want to thank Kevin again for being on the show, opening up his home to me, um, being open to talk about so much, and um, like I said, his hospitality. If you're interested in checking out some of Kevin's pieces, um, go check out his Instagram. His username is at the Kevin Fuller. That's T H E E Kevin Fuller, like the with two E's. And Kevin Fuller, you can, yeah, it's pretty simple. The Kevin Fuller. Um, and you can shoot him a DM if you're interested in working with him. Um, he showed me some of the stuff that he's working on for the future. And I am super stoked to see how it comes out. It Some of that stuff um, that he showed me is really awesome. Never Seriously, very unique. Like, I haven't seen anything like it. Um, he's doing some really awesome stuff. Um, but, yeah, shoot him a DM. Work with him. His clients don't suck. Remember that. So, if you suck, don't, don't hit him up. But anyways... Uh, <laughs> if you made it to the end of this episode and you're thinking, Hey, I, I enjoyed that. I, I had a good time, um, hanging out with Andrew and Kevin. Um, I have a feeling you would also really enjoy going back to listen to episode 16 that I did with my friend Kohan Scott. And, um, he goes by CC and CC is a super talented guy. Um, he's a musician. His style is also very unique. Um, he just came out with new music recently, um, and he draws his inspiration from like all kinds of music, like Outkast, Kanye West, Coheed and Cambria, Incubus, Stevie Wonder, um, just just to name off the top of my head. But he has a crazy amount of music knowledge and its history, and we had just like an awesome conversation, um, and and about music and culture and. For the same reason I feel like uh, you would like this episode, I feel like you would like that episode as well. Um, It had the same kind of feel. So if you want to keep those those vibes going, then definitely go back into the archives to check out episode 16. Um, Coming up next, we got episode 64. Wow, who would have guessed? 64 comes after 63? Wow. (laughs) But most importantly, it doesn't matter about the number, but it matters about who it is. And that is my friend Trey Reed. Um, He is no stranger to this podcast. He was actually on episode five, a true OG, one of the very first guests I ever had. And this was before the podcast was even a thing. Like no episodes were released yet. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I would definitely go back and check that one out in preparation. So you get more of Trey's backstory. Um, but if you don't want to go back and listen, that's fine. Episode 64 will still be very entertaining. You won't be missing out. But um, in that episode, we talked about um, like his upbringing and all kinds of stuff. But in a nutshell, Trey is a world traveler, a multilinguist, and a musician. And growing up, Trey was like an older brother to me. He actually babysat my brother and I when we were kids. And uh, back on episode 5, we talked about politics Uh, mental illness, gun control, being a libertarian. And then we got into his personal story and growing up um, without his father. Um, And and obviously that was a a big chunk of our conversation. And so we didn't even have time to discuss um, his huge two-year trip to Korea. Um, So that's exactly what we talked about this time. We talked about um, his two-year stint over there in South Korea and uh, let me tell you, that story is nuts. He got screwed over, disrespected, and um, grew to kind of hate living there for a while um, for his first year. But then uh, the second year there, uh, he says, was the best year of his life. And uh, it was a really, really awesome story. That episode will be coming out very, very soon. So stay tuned. And... Uh, my goal is to get to 70 episodes by New Year's Day. That means I need to schedule three more podcasts and release seven. Hopefully I can make that happen. <laughs> Woo, let's go, son. Let's go on that podcast hustle. But uh, if you made it this far into the podcast, I want to um, extend the invitation to go rate this podcast on iTunes. Because it really, really, really helps me out. And iTunes is the number one place for people to discover new podcasts. I really want to get into like the new and noteworthy section of iTunes. That would be really awesome. 
Um, if you want to help me grow this show, you like what I'm doing here, that would be really helpful. If you can just go to iTunes, take a minute and go rate at five stars. I know it might not seem like a big deal, but it's a big deal to me. And um, I think I have 49 five-star reviews. So if you want to go up there and be the 50th, I would not be disappointed about that. Um, but yeah, another way that you can help me grow this podcast is just by simply sharing it with a friend who you think would enjoy it. But that that's that's that makes sense, right? Word of mouth, just do it. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, you can go to my website, andrewdeitch.com. I'm going to shut up now and end this thing. So thanks again for listening, everybody. You guys are the best. And I can't wait to bring you more awesome conversations very, very soon. So uh, see you later, everybody. And he said, okay. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> you can't say no to that. <laughs>